face challenges along the way. Three presenters, one each, from the domains of libraries, archives, and museums will outline the vision they bring to their institutions, how they envision the major points of commonality, their greatest hurdles, and how the lessons learned in collection development of physical collections do or do not apply to the digital domain. And we have a great moderator to enable them to do this. Uh, to welcome our guest moderator and distinguished speakers, the planning group, and I should say with unanimous consent, decided to invite John Palfrey to do so for two reasons. First, it was he who initiated this idea of staff-generated conversations, and second, it was he who supported all of us to bring these conversations to all of you, our colleagues. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ines, and thank you to all of you for coming out today to have this important strategic conversation um, there is nothing that I have done during my time at Harvard that I'm more excited or prouder about than working with the group of uh, 50 or so staff members who, during a very complicated time, as we are transitioning from one library system to another, have joined together as volunteers with their own time and all of their own insight um, to lead us in a series of conversations about the future on the merits, about the substance. And I know that in the very first planning meetings that we had, this topic was one that several people said, yes, let's do it. And I think it is a testament to that can-do spirit, the American pragmatic can-do spirit, as well as a sense of the higher order of what we want to accomplish and where we want to go as the Harvard Library that we're all here today. Um, so I hope you will all join me in a round of applause for the Harvard Library Strategic Conversations Planning Group. And I know also that uh, this library system will thrive as a partnership between all of us who care about uh, the future of our system. And I think it's uh, a wonderful thing that this event joins not just the Harvard Library Strategic Conversations, but also the Office of the Senior Associate Provost and others who have helped to support us. So Mary Lee and Helen and your teams, we're very grateful that you have been willing to uh, partner on this event as well. And um, I think it is a testament to this uh, coming together that we have such an amazing group of panelists to, uh, to lead us in this conversation. Um, I know that there will be a formal introduction from uh, Gunter, but I can't imagine uh, Holly, Tom, uh, and David, a more wonderful group to lead us uh, today in discussion. I wanted to um, uh, give one tiny uh, note about um, uh, David and his role. This is something that I find uh, a, a pleasing little uh, um, concept, which is you may know that in Washington, the President of the United States is called <laughs> the POTUS, President of the United States, and some people refer to the Vice President as V. POTUS, and my mom has been working for the First Lady, and they call her FLOTUS, um, and David, with his title, is the Archivist of the United States, so he's called AOTUS, which I think is a wonderful <laughs> little point. So we are joined by um, experts from uh, across the United States and into Canada and AOTUS. Um, please join me in welcoming this wonderful panel. Thank you. Can we bring up the slides? Thank you. I'm nothing without my slides, clearly. Um, I also want to uh, thank the, the um, planning committee for inviting me to help moderate the event today. This is a great pleasure um, for me to be here. It's something that you know those of you who know me know that I feel very passionately about, library archive museum collaboration. And these kinds of events are really always sort of highlights of my work life where we come together and we seek a better understanding of sort of the different cultures we come from, work cultures we come from, and the things we could achieve together. It's always really, really um, a beautiful thing. Um, and I thought I'd introduce the topic today with a couple of brief remarks before we go over to our speakers uh, to kick us off. So when you try to figure out what to do next or where to go, sometimes it's helpful to consider where you've been. So with tongue in cheek and fully acknowledging that this is completely reductionistic, I'm going to give you a short history of libraries, archives, and museums in about three and a half slides or so. <laughs> Watch me fail. 
Um, so the modern day library, archive, and museum really started in the 17th century with the cabinets of curiosities of gentlemen scholars. And arguably, those brought together books, um, let's pretend that this is a manuscript, archives, and materials that we now think should be in museums, objects, into one particular physical space. And that is not all that democratic, because at the end of the day, this was done for one person and maybe their hunting bodies to enjoy. It's not all that economic. You know, These folks spent enormous amounts of money on their cabinets of curiosities. But it is amazingly integrated. Um, this is really where all these materials still live together. In the next stage on our romp to time, uh, we have a stage I call one for each, libraries, archives, and museums. This is when the rise of the modern day nation state sort of demands that we have better management for all these materials that the populace demands that they have access to and that need to be well managed. The onslaught of those materials that the modern day nation state produces really uh, force us to specialize. So we have the libraries, archives, and museums we now know about uh, starting to exist at that point, arising out of these cabinets of curiosity. Some of the first um, libraries, archives, and museums really came directly from the collections of the gentlemen scholars. So this is more democratic, arguably, while well, the whole impetus here was to provide the people with access to the material. It's more economic if you think about, it's very economic to say, well, this type of material gets managed here, that type of material gets managed there, and this other stuff gets managed over here. But at the end of the day, you know, every, every solution creates a new problem. This is also a lot less integrated. Now we've sort of split ourselves into these three worlds that we're trying to bring together again now. So today, uh, we're at a stage I call one for all again. And I don't really mean to reference Google here. All I mean to reference is this idea that our users are used to, in to interacting with materials in a highly integrated fashion. They're used to being able to search through a single search box. They're used, to be, they're, they're used to accessing all of their friends within one platform, and so on and so forth. Everything is aggregated for people online, um, arguably with the exception of library, archive, and museum content. No. So <laughs> libraries, archives, and museums are challenged by this to come together, and this coming together uh, is denoted by this, uh, again, tongue-in-cheek acronym LAM, the LAM, and they're trying to leverage this platform that the internet really is, which arguably now allows us to do the thing that is most democratic with 24-7 access, most economic because the platform already exists, the internet, we don't need to invent, invent it, it's already there, and it would allow us to live in the most integrated world yet. So. I would argue we're all in one way or another trying to take advantage of this and one exemplar of that that we don't have on the panel today and that's why I'm bringing it up uh, would be the State Libraries, Archives and Museums of Alaska who uh, just like Tom have uh, or are in the process of building a building where their libraries, archives and museums are coming together and they're trying to take advantage of the synergies between these different communities. But this is admittedly hard work, and that's why we're together here, to sort of start engaging on a conversation about what this actually means. And here are some of the, of the planning documents from uh, the State Libraries, Archives, and Museums of Alaska. Here's a, here's a snapshot of how they were thinking about how the spaces themselves could be integrated. Um, here's another document that outlines how they thought about how they functionally could be more integrated. And this was... Um, this is hard work to try to come to a consensus around this and come together around this. Um, and it, it needs a lot of deep, deep thinking. Um, the reason why it's hard work in part is because we have as professions sort of grown up like twins who've been separated at birth or triplets who've been separated at birth. We all have our own professional organizations, our own uh, types of training, our own uh, ways of thinking about our audience, and, and I'm not going to read through this chart. This is uh, something that um, I've used when I teach graduate school to give students uh, an, a sort of first introduction to how these cultures are different, because if you've not moved in these cultures, it's very hard to communicate. And this is far, far from perfect. This is, uh, you know, you could debunk every single thing on this slide, and I hope we will during the course of the day. But it, it gives you sort of a hit of what's 
what might be different about these cultures and sort of the, the gap that might need to be bridged or the different kinds of terminologies we might need to uh, learn from one another. So uh, one of the reasons I'm standing up here, I think, is because one of the things I've done is uh, lead a library archive museum workshops when I was still working for OCLC Research. And I'm bringing this up again now. This is sort of an old hat by now. These workshops happened, in, I think, in 2008. It's been quite a while now. Um, but I bring it up again to share that there actually is a methodology we developed uh, back in that day that was very, very effective in bringing people together and actually creating tangible outcomes. So if, if you at Harvard or, or other guests who, who are not from Harvard but from other cultural institutions from the greater Boston area would feel like this is something we want to engage in, in more depth on, all those materials are available about how we ran these workshops and they might make a good model or at least serve as inspiration for you to follow. So I just want to share really briefly how we structured the days during those workshops, because I think they say, it says a lot about how you can bring people together in a sort of neutral space where everybody feels equally valued and where you can then walk them through an exercise that actually leads to a result. We used the exa exact same agenda at every single one of those meetings. Um, and Roughly speaking, what we did was we allowed people to first talk about their current collaborations so they could you know, feel proud of what they'd already done. Then we talked to them about obstacles because you can't really have a conversation about what to do next unless you've sort of let everybody vent a little and move the obstacles out of the way. Next we talked about a vision and this was really the most exciting and important part of the entire day. Um, it's important to really focus on the what in these big conversations and not the how. And the vision really let people articulate the what. What did they really want to achieve? Um, and this is important because if you have a what, if you know what the big thing is you're driving towards, then you can always haggle about the strategy and about the, the, the how, um, but you're not going to lose sight of that big goal once you've agreed on it. And last but not least, we, we sort of said, OK, now tell us what are actual steps you could do, actionable projects that could get you a step closer to that vision. And every single workshop came out with um, two or three of those actionable projects that were uh, quite inspiring. And many, many of them have followed through on those projects. This is uh, an exemplar from that workshop. This is a, a, the a right board from the Yale workshop. And I'm, I'm showing it just to, sh to say briefly that at every single one of the workshops, what came up and was highlighted was integrated access. Every one of those uh, campuses or campus-like institutions we held the workshops at felt very strongly that they did a disservice to their audience by not having a single place where people could discover what's held at that great institution. Um, and this came up strongly at, Har uh, at Yale as well. Um, interestingly enough, though, at Yale, people felt what was even more important for them was to actually have an administrative home for Library Archive Museum collaboration. And during the workshop, they called it the Federation of Yale Collections. Um, ultimately, th the workshop was one of the many impetuses that then led to the creation of the Office of Digital Assets and Infrastructure, which Mick Bellinger is heading. Um, it wasn't called that during the workshop, but it was very interesting that Yale really converged on we want to find a home for this activity so it doesn't just peter out you know, after the next project is done. And with that, um, I want to acknowledge that at Harvard, those of you who are from Harvard, you're all going through a really, really big transition right now. And I, can, I only can imagine that some of you are sitting here uh, either you know, elated about the changes that are happening and hopeful, or I'm sure also some of you are sitting here feeling somewhat doubtful or you know, sort of with a heavy pain in their heart because you don't quite know how things are going to turn out. And therefore, I decided, again, very tongue in cheek, to uh, bring you this little quote, which <coughs> may be applicable both to the library transition you're all going through, but also to the larger picture of libraries, archives, and museums and what might be possible precisely because you're going through this, this crisis at the present moment. You never want a serious crisis to go to waste. <laughs> and what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. So you can tell that I work in Washington, D.C. now. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but I thought it was appropriate to bring that up. You're going through a big transition specifically in the libraries. This might also provide a big opening for Library Archive Museum collaboration mm -hmm. for all of you. So I think it's, a, it's great that this topic was proposed for uh, a half day of discussion and consideration. And um, I think it's very, very appropriate to do that. So without further ado from me, I want to introduce our speakers. Um, and I think I'll just introduce you one at a time. So we'll start with David Ferrerio. He doesn't really need an introduction. He is AOTUS, as you now know. Um, and I've asked every single one of our speakers to give a very brief sentence about themselves with the words library, archive, and museum in it. And David has given me this sentence. David has been involved in library, archive, museum related activities at each of the institutions he has served, culminating in his current position overseeing 44 facilities, each embodying these three cultures. David. Was that, um, was that Ron Emanuel? We couldn't see. It. Yes, it was Ron Emanuel. So I'd just like to point out and remind everyone that that guy who who gave that quote is no longer in Washington. <laughs> Does that tell us something? <laughs> it's really a pleasure to be home again uh, and to see so many familiar p faces, friends from Harvard and former employees from, from MIT who jumped ship and came here uh, or over the time that, that I was in the MIT libraries. It's really nice to be here. This um, topic is one that's very important to me and has become important to me only in the last two and a half years. It's only uh, in the last two and a half years that I have been challenged about my credentials. Um, <laughs> challenged by the archival community because what does a librarian know about, about archives? So I thought what I would do is to start by just um, uh, explaining how I got here where I am. Um, a little bit of, um, of history about my own career. Um, talk to you about the National Archives so you have some sense of who we are and what we do, because most people don't know who we are and what we do. Um, and talk to you about some planning activities that are going on now at the National Archives that should be of interest to you. So I started my life um, as a shelver in the Humanities Library at MIT in 1965. It was a co-op job. I was a co-op. Um, student at Northeastern University. It was like my second co-op job. My very first co-op job was working, um, doing recreational therapy for the criminally insane <laughs> at a facility in um, Newtown, Connecticut. I, the archivist of the United States taught square dancing to the criminally insane. <laughs> so my second job was um, shelving books in the MIT libraries. I was an education major. My co-op advisor thought that was associated with education. So it was the introduction to my uh, career in, um, in research libraries. But it was also um, an opportunity, an introduction to every, just about every aspect of life in a research library. There was no preservation program in 1965 um, at MIT, but the woman I worked for was very interested in preservation. So I got to, to learn about, you know, from the ground floor, learn about the latest techniques in preservation and conservation, like oiling leather bindings, like um, mylar encapsulation, like we hired Captain Kuna long before there was um, a more formal George Kuna to come and teach us deacidification using Alka-Seltzer tablets, <laughs> dipping, dipping newsprint in Alka-Seltzer. MIT was an incredible place to learn, and those of you who, who are still at MIT or, or have, have had training at MIT know what a great um, environment it is. I um, left the libraries um, at some point, joined the Navy, um, was a hospital corpsman, um, used those psychiatric skills that I learned um, during my first co-op job. I was a neuropsychiatric tech. I was a um, corpsman assigned to a Marine Battalion during Vietnam. So I had, uh, and I, the, the only reason I mention that is that it gives you one, gives one a perspective about life. Um, so when people are running around with like the sky is falling, you know, my first question is, is there a life at stake here? So let's put this in perspective. So that was uh, an important lesson that I, I, I got from uh, my time in the Navy. I went from MIT in 1996 to Duke University where I was the librarian. I uh, spent eight years at Duke. 
an incredible eight years for a uh, university librarian because the president at the time, Nan Cohan, believed very strongly that the librarian was part of her senior administration. So I got to do things like curriculum reform, campus master planning, um, academic technology, things that my peers at the time weren't, didn't have opportunities to do. So it was a phenomenal learning experience for me and thought um, that I would retire from Duke University. I loved it so much. But the New York Public Library called, and you know when the New York Public Library calls, you listen, um, and was recruited to be the director of the four wonderful research libraries that, that comprise the New York Public Library. We went through a major um, planning re reorganization activity at, 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 uh, during my time there, and we collapsed the research and branch libraries into one organization, and overnight, I went from four libraries to 91. I was the director of the New York Public Libraries. Wonderful, wonderful opportunity for the first time to work in public libraries. Um, and I've never, never had that experience before. And let me tell you, in terms of value to the community, it was a terrific learning experience. Every one of those branch libraries plays a very important role in the lives of New Yorkers. So that was a, an incredible, incredible learning experience and then the call to the National Archives. In every one of my jobs, I have had responsibility for libraries, museums, and archives to some extent. At MIT, um, libraries, of course, research libraries, we were, uh, had a uh, growing uh, MIT museum at that point, a uh, close relationship with, um, with the library, and uh, the, as I said, the emerging um, preservation program. And archives and records management, I at one point, if you can believe this, was Helen Samuel's supervisor. <laughs> a woman who needs no supervisor. Um, so I learned at the feet of Helen Samuel's all about um, archives and records management. So when I got to Duke um, and they, through a reorganization, Nan came to me and said, would you take over the archives? I said, only if you will let me create a records management program at the same time. So. I've been in this space forever. So to be now the archivist of the United States and by challenged and be and to be challenged by my own staff <laughs> about my credentials around archives is the reason that I'm spending a lot of time obsessing about the interrelationships between libraries, archives, and museums. Selfishly so I can convince my own staff um, that there is some territory here to be to be um, dealt with. When you, when you strip it down to its bare essentials, we are all in the same business. Collecting, protecting, and encouraging the use of. Fill in the last piece of it, but it's the same function. The audiences may be different, the techniques may be different, but in terms of what we're up to, that's what it's all about. So I have been focused in my reorganization plan um, and culture change at the National Archives in working with the staff to share share that expertise across those boundaries. So let me just tell you a little bit about the National Archives and how complex it is. It is 44 facilities around the country. There are three here in Massachusetts, um, Waltham, Federal Record Center, Pittsfield, a wonderful, uh, was once a microfilm collection, um, and the JFK Library um, and Columbia Point. Those are the three facilities here. So we are a combination nationwide, 13 presidential libraries, federal record centers, combination of museums, um, 700 Pennsylvania Avenue, wonderful museum, College Park, Maryland, wonderful museum there, and the museums spread out in each of the presidential libraries and some of our record centers also. Um, federal record centers um, from Anchorage, Alaska to Atlanta, Georgia. A collection of, uh, we estimate now, 12 billion pieces of paper, 40 million photographs, miles and miles of film and video. And the biggest growing collection is electronic records, and that's what we're focused on right now. Um, to give you some sense, um, we collected, started collecting electronic mail during the Reagan administration, 8 million email messages from that. White House, 20 million from the Clinton White House, 210 million from the George W. Bush White House. So that gives you some sense of where we're going in terms of government-wide, the shift from paper to electronic information. I was recruited to lead the National Archives and, and the marketing around this um, uh, wooing of me 
was all centered around the president's open government initiative, an attempt to create transparency, participation, and collaboration within the government. And I took a look at that mandate and said, what a way to think about reorganizing your work around those three principles. The government directive um, calls for each agency to create an open government plan, which describes to the president how you're going to do your business differently, internally and with your customers. So it was a, for, for a new guy coming in, it was a great opportunity to use that as a leverage for rethinking the agency and getting people to work together in a different way, both internally and the, facing our customers. And we have used the participation, collaboration, transparency themes throughout that planning process, as well as the themes of the three cultures, so that we're in the process of creating one, cultures, one culture for the National Archives, which brings museums, archives, and libraries together in one seamless organization for our, our users. We're at about a year into the process now. Uh, we've had some ups uh, and some downs, um, some successes and some not successes, but the most important thing is that we have people talking for the first time about what it is they do and how it differs, but more importantly, how it is similar to the other aspects of the National Archives experience. So I'll stop there and hope that we're not gonna talk at you for three hours, but we're gonna have a, a conversation. Next, we're going to hear from Holly Witchie, who, Holly, what's your title du jour? Oh, today? <laughs> today I'm founding faculty in the Johns Hopkins Master's Degree in Museum and Administration, uh, yeah, Museum Studies. Holly Witchie, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, she also oh. gave me a sentence, which I will read to you. Holly has been in the museum field for 25 years, the first decade as a curator, the second decade as a director of new media, and museum emiss emissary to the then far off lands of libraries and archives. And now she works with graduate students to identify and leverage points of convergence among the three communities. I'd like to thank the program committee for inviting me to be a part of today's conversation. I'm honored to be here at Harvard and in front of such a distinguished panel and audience. Um, I'm bookended by leaders on either side speaking here today. I'm a foot soldier um, in uh, the Library Archive Museum Convergence effort. No doubt for many of the librarians in this group, and I'm assuming that the vast majority of you are librarians or archivists, you will soon discover, if you aren't already aware of the fact, that museum professionals like myself particularly content specialists like curators and educators, are different. We're incapable of couching remarks in anything other than a narrative. As Gunter has pointed out, we tell stories. We were each of us asked to make some brief remarks discussing professional experience in the direction of LAM convergence. This semester I'm teaching Renaissance art, and so references to hell, purgatory, and heaven have wormed their way into my discussion. <laughs> Let's begin. I normally work to slide, so I'm having to read here today. This is kind of distracting for me. My southern mother from Mobile, Alabama, was a power user of libraries her entire life. I grew up understanding that librarians, and particularly reference librarians, were semi-divine beating, <laughs> beings, be, not beatings, to be treated with deference and respect. In December, they were placated with offerings of pecan tarts and Russian tea cookies. Fast forward to graduate school in the mid to late 1980s. As a PhD student at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, I believed that all libraries could supply the volumes I needed, however obscure, within the hour, or at worst, within a day or two. I lived in a bibliophile's utopia, much as I imagine Harvard to be, although the institutions in Cleveland exist on a much more modest scale. By day, I would sit in my personal carol in the Cleveland Museum of Art, Ingalls Art Library, well lit, surrounded by books, as a graduate student in the joint program at Art History in Case Western Reserve University, I had access along with the curators and the faculty to the closed staff, uh, closed stacks, unlimited access. Volumes were sometimes unavailable because curatorial research needs were top priority. 
But that didn't really matter much to me. I could walk across the street to CWRU's Freiburger Library, which is now a grassy field, um, or take the RTA downtown to the Beaux-Arts Marble Halls of Cleveland Public Library. Generations of Clevelanders had supplied both those institutions with many of the key volumes I needed. They were available in abundance. I seldom found it necessary to request an interlibrary loan. In 1990, newly minted PhD in hand and a brand new husband, well, I only have one husband, I went off to San Diego and soon found a job as associate curator of European art at the San Diego Museum of Art. I came to the position knowing quite, about, quite a bit about 15th century observant Franciscan commentary and political symbolism and knew next to nothing about what it meant to be a curator. My information management skills were sufficient to write a dissertation, but not to manage the collection of European art prior to 1600. I had no training in what it meant to be a curator, and with one exception, neither had any of my curatorial colleagues. We were all academically trained art historians and skilled researchers, and each of us had his or her own quirky system for managing our collection. I should point out that the IMLS believes there are about 17,500 museums in the United States, each curator of which has their own system for managing information. <laughs> I had objects, um, curators, however, I would say are familiar at what an archivist might call the document level with what convergence means. Um, for better or for worse, our jobs are about the convergence of library, library archives and museums, but we all do it idiosyncratically. I had objects to care for, research, publish, and interpret, and so a museum. I had a legacy of files and folders with documentation from previous curators and scholars to which I contributed my own in turn. I had an archive. I had access to a pitifully small museum library with uneven collections, incomplete volumes of journals, few resources, and two dedicated librarians, one paid, one volunteer, who did their best in trying conditions. So like most of my predecessors at the small institution, in absence of any kind of professional training, with no concept of the importance of standardized vocabularies, I developed my own system of organization and headed down the path with good intentions, to hell with good intentions. I did not know what I did not know. And because those in curatorial positions, even mere associate curators, were at close to the top of the museum food chain, nobody tried to tell me how to do my job. I spent the next decade slowly learning what I didn't know in terms of information management and why information management is the key, not just to the success or failure, but to relevance for museums in the 21st century. I might never have learned what I didn't know had it not been for the advent of the use of new technologies in museum education in the early 1990s. Soon after the National Gallery in London launched its innovative microgallery in, in 1991, a trustee from the San Diego Museum of Art visiting London called up and said, I'll pay for it if you guys will make one. And we became the first institution in the country with an interactive multimedia art gallery. We had a budget of close to $500,000, complete with a $20,000 dye sublimation printer that allowed uh, visitors to get eight by 10 high resolution color images of objects on demand. For my sins, I had project managed a beautiful one-off system for a museum that still kept its collection records on file cards in wooden drawers. It would be another two to three years and at least a dozen more one-off projects before the various departments with a vested interest in sharing information about the collections, curatorial education, and the library and the registrars sat down to talk about investing in a collections management system. And longer still, before the various silos in the museum began to break down. The departments concerned were separated geographically at the museum. Um, the curatorial and education were downstairs in the administrative offices. Over on the other side of the museum, completely across the museum, an island next to the loading dock housed the registrars, and the library was in a completely other building. Um, even if it hadn't been for the geographic differences, that might not have mattered so much, but the various departments couldn't talk to one another. Individual curators, registrars, the librarians all felt a certain amount of righteous indignation that their way of processing, organizing, and retrieving information was not being recognized as the best way to get the job done. In the end, the registrars got a small gift to purchase a license for gallery systems in Bark and unilaterally made decisions about how information would be stored at the museum. During this period, my duties as assigned were more often than not associated with the production and of content and project management of gallery interactives for special exhibitions. 
By the end of the 1990s, museums across the country had begun to feature interactive installations, but few museums had the necessary software, hardware, and user interface design teams in-house, so much of the work was undertaken with outside contractors. That meant that you had to have someone in the museum who could convince the educators and curators that this was a good thing, and someone who could talk to the outside contractors. And so there were a group of us who are dinosaurs now, and that's what we did. We didn't really learn the technology, and we didn't really, we were content specialists, and we were talking um, to interactive, con uh, uh, to outside consultants. These same teams, um, unless a museum happened to have it, uh, these same teams were responsible for our first websites. That is, unless a museum had a tech-savvy individual in some other department, or more likely the director, one of the trustees, or somebody had a friend, Bob, who could build a website for you. <laughs> and now for purgatory. In 2000, I left San Diego in the curatorial world, and I returned to Cleveland as the manager of the newly instituted Department of New Media at the Cleveland Museum of Art. New location, new title, bigger museum, more resources, same problems. Um, the Registrar's Department used a custom-built proprietary collections management system built along the lines of a different custom-built proprietary collections management system at the National Gallery of Art. The library man ran and managed its own systems. The curators were supposed to supply the Registrar's Office with the most up-to-date information, but because at the time the curators were not allowed to enter any of their data themselves, only the Registrar was allowed to enter it, they all kept their own separate systems, and that's where they put the most up-to-date information. About this time, there was a wave of interest in LAM convergence from the museum side, and in 2002, the president and board of trustees of AAM, the American Association of Museums, uh, agreed, we say agreed, but were invited to become a part of something called the Joint Committee of Archives and Libraries. That was what it was then. It's a committee that was started in uh, 1970 by the SAA and the ALA, and in 2002, we were thinking about convergence, and um, museums were invited to join. The AAM board appointed three senior administrators to represent the museum committee, including Ken Hama, then director for digital policy and management at the J. Paul Getty Trust, Bill Barnett, vice president and CIO of the Field Museum, and Chuck Patch, who for 21 years had been the director of information systems at the historic New Orleans collection. They were heavy hitters. And on the ALA side, the fantastic Bev Lynch at UCLA was sitting on the committee. Um, I was invited in in 2004 because they needed some foot soldiers to do some of the things. While they were dealing with, the, while the big people were dealing with the policy, they needed a few of us on the committee to get some work done. 18 months later, Ken Hama had retired, Chuck Patch had moved, Bill Barnett had left the field, and I was the only person on the AAM committee. It stayed that way until 2007, and this entire period we would meet Three times a year, CALM meets three times a year, we are all appointed by our various professional organizations, we have no membership constituency, and we had five goals. To foster and develop ways and means of affecting closer cooperations between the three professional organizations. To encourage the establishment of common standards. To undertake activities as assigned by the committee by one or more of its parent bodies. To initiate programs of relevant and a timely nature, and refer matters of concern back. Function four was the only one we ever managed to do. We initiate programs. Nothing else happened. Function two, to encourage the establishment of common standards, was frequently on the table at the three meetings a year, but it always fell by the wayside because museums, unlike libraries and archives, have no universally agreed upon common standards for museums as institutions, and perhaps far more importantly, there are no commonly accepted standards for the training of museum professionals. Museum studies programs are apples and oranges and peaches and pears and guas. There's no way around it. Let me give you a brief example. I teach in two museum studies programs. I teach in, a, in an online museum studies program at Johns Hopkins, which has a focus on technology skills, for museum professionals, and I teach traditional core museum studies in an art history program at Case Western Reserve University. They both take 10 courses. The Hopkins students take 10 courses and focus on the use of technologies in museum setting, generally courses applicable across a broad variety of museums. If they choose elective courses on collections management and systems and cataloging, ethics and new technologies, and LAM convergence in collecting institutions, the last two courses are mine. 
My CWRU students take 10 courses as well, but they focus solely on the visual arts with one year of introduction to museum work by people from the, uh, the museum at the Clay Museum of Art coming in and giving what I did today in my office. I'm not here today to euthanize museums or to eulogize libraries and archives. I'm here to reinforce that we need to learn to work together and to acknowledge in the balance of things that from my perspective, museums have a great deal to learn from how libraries have traditionally been open to change and thus remained relevant to the communities it is their mission to serve. Museums are now asked to be participatory, to be transparent, to make information readily available and accessible 24-7. And the students with a regular museum studies degree falls far short of the mark when compared to the applicant with a knowledge of systems and structure and standardized vocabularies. The new museum studies professional is just as likely to have come from the library world as the museum world. And the MLS with a museum studies focus fills a need in museums that are being reluctantly pulled into the 21st century. The museum community's reluctance to make real and significant changes to deep-rooted and celebrated idiosyncratic practices means that within many museums, there are two museums. The first, an entrenched and not necessarily older constituency of content specialists longing for the good old days who feel increasingly marginalized and undervalued. They are threatened by the, larger, uh, they are threatened by the introduction of new systems and new technologies. The second museum is an ever larger, increasingly professionalized staff that recognizes the potential uh, value of, to the museum of good, clean, rich, searchable data. Museums have had a hard time focusing on the larger issue of land convergence because they can't see the forest for the trees yet. So the situation still feels like purgatory to me much of the time, but I get occasional glimpses of paradise in my <laughs> students. The up and coming generation of our audiences expect convergence. They want information and they want it when they want it and they don't expect to have to work to find it. When I have my researcher hat on, I feel the same way. I wanted to scream at Western Reserve Historical Society the other day when I typed in the name of a famous Clevelander and realized I was only getting the uh, archive results. The good news is the up and coming generation of museum professionals, those in the process of getting their degrees, emerging and mid-career professionals are more than willing to work from below affecting change from the ground up. For the past three years, I've watched students make important contributions in thought and in practice to LAM convergence. The least we can do as seniors in the field for the livelihood of our institutions is to meet them halfway. Thank you. And last but not least, we have with us Tom Hickerson, Vice Provost of Libraries and Cultural Resources from the University of Calgary. And Tom describes himself in the following way. Starting with integrating access to library and museum holdings, library and archive holdings, forgive me, Tom moved on to digitizing museum collections and has now designed a building to house and support the use and display of all of these, as well as evolving media. It just keeps getting better. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me without my individual mic? Okay, I see back row there. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I wanna thank the committee for uh, uh, bringing us together and I wanna thank each of you for uh, being here to participate in the, in the discourse. Very much looking forward to it. So I'll just to, um, because uh, Calgary might be a, uh, a foreign city to some of you. Uh, perhaps I'll just mention that uh, uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada is a, uh, is a million person city in the uh, northwestern part of this continent. Uh, the University of Calgary is a very young uh, public institution, uh, less than 50 years old with uh, 30,000 students uh, about uh, 8,000 graduate students among those 30,000. So, um, so I'm, uh, I'm pleased to be here today. It's actually my uh, second uh, trip to the Northeast Coast within the last seven days. So I, I, uh, I'm uh, 
I'm not feeling used to being here. I'm just not feeling used to being at home. So, um, but, uh, but to proceed with a discussion, and, uh, and I'm pleased to, uh, to address the topic. Societies have expressed a need to preserve a record in some form recording the human experience, their acts of governance, industry, and religion, their property and lineage, military events and natural tragedies, and their scientific and artistic achievements. That record can be verbal and preserved by human memory or by audio recordings. It can be pictorial, including pictographs, cuneiform letters and numerals, and visual imagery, recording iconographic, historic, or artistic manifestations. Diverse substances and, and substances and surfaces can be employ, employed, ranging from electrical charges to monumental sculptures. Various societies have sought to preserve and make accessible for purposes of communication, observation, self-identity, representations in innumerable forms. To some degree, we are what we retain, and we retain what we are. We seek to un as we seek to understand the role and value of such objects for diverse societies, these objects, items, specimens, or stuff frequently cannot be singularly categorized. For sometimes the vellum is as important as the words. The canvas may be as significant as the painting. The marble may be as significant as the carving. And each records something different and with a value that society changes over time. Thus it is surprising that we insistently seek to establish strict institutional and professional characterizations based on rigid definitions of form, format, and material. I would like to encourage you to embrace a multifaceted curatorial vision in which we all can contribute in common cause to a world in which understanding is illuminated by the inclusion of the diversity of riches that we gather, preserve, describe, and make available for artifactual use, and increasingly for digital access, exploration, and knowledge creation. In characterizing this vision for the future, I will first assert that it has seldom been as we describe, and that research libraries in particular have always had a remarkably diverse cornucopia of objects. My second assertion is that we have remarkably fertile connections among the holdings of libraries, archives, and museums. My third assertion is, is that while most people, even many scholars, never understood the differences on which we stood so firmly in the traditional world, in the digital world they have no appreciation nor tolerance for such distinctions. And in conclusion, I believe that an environment in which we employ our various expertise and our curatorial wealth for collective outcome has the potential to dramatically enhance our educational research and community impact. I will seek to make my case through four examples that I hope speak convincingly to all of the above. And the first is the artwork, field notes, and correspondence of Louis Agassiz Fuertes. Fuertes was one of five artists and photographers that were included in the scientific team chosen for the 1899 Harriman expedition to Alaska to document the Alaskan coast. Purities was specifically included uh, to record bird life. And he was quite knowledgeable in the field and had written his senior thesis on the coloration in birds. I've sometimes heard that ornithologists find Audubon a better painter, but Purities actually knew what birds looked like. <laughs> The Cornell University Library, in its Rare Books and Manuscripts Division, holds um, Furity's uh, field notes from that trip, all of his correspondence, his images from that trip, and some 2,400 other images. And in building a website focusing on, the, on, Harriman's, on Furity's participation in the Harriman expedition, we digitized the journal pages, we transcribed them, we put links in them, to images from, the, uh, uh, from his collection of those particular birds. But on the Cornell campus, there, the uh, Laboratory of Ornithology already had 
all of the, uh, many of the finished oils from his work that were located there. And in the uh, art museum was a uh, collection largely of prints from a, an a, uh, early West Texas expedition. And we came to know, often after the fact, that when a uh, scholar uh, came to campus and visited one of those collections, frequently they left without any knowledge that the other ones were blocks away. So at, we added to the collection of images uh, from, the, from the Harriman expedition all of the images from the art museum and from the laboratory of ornithology. And interestingly, um, whether this is uh, function following form or form following function, uh, shortly after we completed the digitization, the laboratory of ornithology transferred all of their images to the library. And to further make my point, I found that the campus vertebrate collection had many of the preserved birds that Furities had shot and preserved to, for his work. I uh, have commented that I tried to figure out a way to use those birds in the same images, but it, it kept reminding me of Monty Python's dead parrot routine. <laughs> <laughs> However, I will say that uh, I, I was pleased to find out as a result of, uh, of uh, seeing uh, Connie Rinaldo uh, at the uh, conference at uh, Woods Hole uh, laboratory um, this past Monday uh, that in fact she mentioned that something uh, more ambitious and quite impressive is going on here with the William Brewster collection so uh, uh, William Brewster all uh, interesting to tell you uh, he was the curator of the uh, comparative zoology uh, collection at uh, uh, here at Harvard from 1895 to 1902, and uh, birds were his particular specialty, and he collected some 850 specimens and another 2,800 uh, he gathered, and uh, um, that body of material, uh, along with, uh, with the assistance of the, of the Ernest Mayer uh, Library, are going to be incorporated into a major new database and, and digital work. Um, including some 9,000 archival pages, as well as the uh, 4,650 4, specimens. And so that will be a remarkable uh, outcome, and I was delighted to hear about that. Uh, this is part of a large IMLS project uh, led by the California Academy of Science. So my second example is, uh, is Maxwell Bates, and Maxwell Bates as a Canadian artist and uh, art attack, architect. And um, soon after going to the University of Calgary, I found that the, uh, that the art museum on campus had uh, a large number of his paintings, um, that in fact the special collections unit of the library had, uh, had his correspondence and journals from a long period of time as a prisoner of war during World War II and that another special collection, the Canadian Architectural Archives, which is the largest collection of the work of Canadian ar uh, architects, saying architects, archivists, and yeah, so forth, right. it gets you down. <laughs> anyway, um, um, uh, was also there. Also, of course, there were um, published books, and uh, uh, one of which was published by the University of Calgary Press. And there was a major digitization project that produced a website at the University of Victoria and that he finished his architectural career in, in British Columbia. But in fact, if you searched any catalog, you probably wouldn't have even found one of them except for the books. And you certainly would not have known that the others were in fact either in the same building or nearby or, or available uh, on the net. Um, so. We've actually employed the, uh, the summon system, I, uh, an overlay system that allows us to enter a, a variety of works uh, of types so that in fact access to all of that material is now uh, inclusively provided, uh, including the website at the University of Victoria. And so most of those materials, at least some access, can be provided digitally, pardon me, digitally. So, uh, I'd like to, to now, in my third example, turn to um, uh, the Military Museums, which is uh, Canada's second uh, uh, museum maintained by the Canadian Forces. And in this building, located in the center of Calgary, 
the University of Calgary has a library archives uh, and an art gallery. And um, we have large collections there uh, supporting uh, study of history and political science and this uh, work in the Center for Military and Strategic Studies. And something in the art gallery that I and my colleagues declared from day one was that in fact that every exhibition there would include um, uh, written and published documentation and artifacts and objects and artwork. So that in fact we approach every item uh, looking at it through that paradigm. And one of my remarkable experiences from, from, uh, from those exhibitions is that um, A.Y. Jackson is uh, one of the uh, group of seven, an increasingly uh, well-known group of uh, Canadian landscape artists. And, um, and there's a painting uh, that we had borrowed from Ottawa that was a, just a ghostly scene of, uh, of gas warfare. And so it's just largely gray with just a few branches of trees that can be just faintly seen uh, through the haze. But immediately in front of it was a World War I gas mask. And if you looked at that gas mask, which was so rudimentary, and was in fact like pulling a burlap bag over your head with a, with a strand to tie it around. Um, I instantly realized in such a visceral fashion what the experience of, of gas warfare was like in a way that I would have never experienced any other way through the combination of those pieces. In conclusion, I'd like to talk about, <clears throat> pardon me, about the Taylor Family Digital Library. So the, the, um, the library is a 265,000 um, square foot building. Um, most of it opened uh, in September of this year. And, uh, and it is um, uh, our concept of a 21st century library. Uh, it's built uh, with raised flooring throughout the building so that in fact that that uh, network and electrical connections are available everywhere, 5,000 electrical connections, 4,000 network connections, uh, includes 27 collaborative um, work areas, includes a visualization studio that has a wall size, 36 million pixel uh, visualization wall. Um, and um, it, it does, in fact, uh, while we built a high-density storage facility at the same time and, and moved the majority of the collection there, it does include nearly a million books and journals. So it's not just a digital library. Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, the surprising thing for the purpose of today's proceedings is, is that, in fact, it also includes a, uh, a full-function art museum. So this was in a separate building before. And the attendance at that museum was steadily going down. Plus, there was a sense that it, uh, uh, that it did not have um, significant relevance to education and research on a daily basis in terms of proving its value to the university mission. And so um, uh, we decided to, um, to move that, uh, that art gallery into the building. Uh, one large main gallery and multiple small galleries, including storage areas, its own loading dock, its own place for putting exhibit cases together and, and so forth. But the other thing about it is, is that it has all of the kinds of technological connections, same raised flooring, so that in fact it can be a tremendous multimedia space uh, in the same fashion that the rest of the facility is. And I will say that in the process of building it, there was a point in time where um, the pressure of, of finances were such uh, that I had to make hard decisions. Uh, but I felt so, and, and um, everyone else probably would have let the museum stay where it was, which certainly would have been to its disadvantage. But I also felt that by bringing it into the building that we would give it a new kind of relevance, a new kind of attention, but we all would also provide our students with the experience of what I describe as the, as, the, uh, uh, as the convergence of knowledge and culture. 
so that in fact that the museum opens right on the main entryway, right across from the Learning Commons, on a pathway where more than 10,000 people pass every day. And even though not every one of them will walk into that gallery, in fact, on the second floor, we have a glass wall so that students can actually look down in the main gallery, actually from study space. And I, uh, I have extremely high hopes uh, for the kinds of exhibitions that we'll bring to life in that space when it opens this fall, uh, ranging across the, the, um, the full inclusion of the wealth of our collections uh, but also incorporating evolving media. And this is going to be a real challenge. Uh, it's, it's kind of my, uh, my next big deal, and um, I'm really excited about the possibilities. Thank you. So um, on your program, it says that the next thing we will do is a discussion with moderator and speakers. We thought we'd interpret that somewhat loosely. We don't want to just be up here and discuss in front of you while you all sit here bravely and patiently. That didn't make a lot of sense. And David pointed out that it didn't make a lot of sense because he said he doesn't like to be talked at, and neither do other people. Uh, so we took his good advice to heart, and what we're trying to do um, now is have a discussion that has some structure to it. Uh, we have uh, sort of four major themes that I'd like to uh, go through, and we'll try to work it in a way that we'll sort of have a little bit of a discussion here about the, about, uh, the particular question at hand, and then we'll invite questions from you, and then we'll move to the next theme, we'll have a little discussion and again, invite questions from you, and we'll try to work our way through it. And let's see how we do with that. Are you agreed with that? All right. OK, so I'll, I'll let you know the themes just so you can sort of gear up for the road ahead. Um, we'll start with uh, motivation. I, we've heard a little bit about this in the presentations already. Um, you know, what bad thing happens if libraries, archives, and museums don't converge? Um, and I want to deepen that a little bit and really ask some pointed questions about that. Then I think we, we owe it to ourselves to talk about obstacles because we know this isn't going to be easy. And I'd like to drill down on that a little bit deeper. I'd also then like to talk about uh, a vision. Uh, it's very easy to sort of get mired in what's difficult and what's hard and what doesn't work and not to elevate to the thing that actually is the thing that we all would like to achieve and we can easily agree upon. And it's actually, it was always quite stunning to me in the Library Archives and Museums workshop how easily it was to agree on a vision and how easily the bridge between libraries, archives, and museums was built. So let's try to do a little bit about, of that here too. And then last but not least, if we get to it, if we manage to work through it all the way, Let's talk about what concrete next steps could be. You know, a vision is something that's lofty and up here. Let's, let's give a little bit of thinking uh, what very concrete, and sometimes they can be small things, we could all do at our individual institutions or we could all do together as a national community of libraries, archives, and museums to work our way forward. So that's the game plan. So uh, we'll start with, with the motivation bit. And again, we'll start with just letting our, our speakers uh, give some commentary on that, but then um, we'll engage you all as well. So motivation, my, my question really is, uh, David gave us this example earlier, you know, that it put things in perspective. When you, when you have a job where, where lives are at stake, it puts everything in perspective and somehow uh, working in a library, archive, and museum, there's, there are different things at stake, but it's still important that things get done. So what's at stake here and what bad things will happen if libraries, archives, and museums don't come together? Um, either locally, sort of when they're under one roof, like they are here at, on a Harvard campus, or like they are at the National Archives, or um, at Tom's place, um, as well as nationally. Give us some of your thoughts. What? OK. Um, we've got to get started. Um, so what if they don't come together? Um, my point is, is they are already together. 
that, that, that um, that's not the way our collections are. That's not the way the, um, the human record has, uh, has been collected. And so what, what our collections in common are missing uh, is us, uh, is bringing our expertise, bringing our capacity, um, but applying that knowledge in a way um, that has the capacity to uh, make those pathways obvious. And in the digital world, um, uh, no one assumes that one should not be able to move, uh, you know, in, in, gosh, seconds is really slow now, um, um, from, the, uh, from the printed word to the, uh, to the handwritten word to the uh, painting and, uh, um, in, in our kind of opening exhibit, we actually, I included meteorites. Uh, so uh, uh, one should be able to, to span the scope, and that's, and that's the way human knowledge has been, has been uh, developed, and, uh, uh, and so it's just really a matter of, of our coming around to bringing that wealth of capacity uh, to common cause. So you're saying we're basically not releasing the value of the thing we're sitting on? Absolutely. I think from a museum perspective, what we risk losing is the connection. Violet and I were talking earlier about how it is, you know, it is the, the function of, you understand your function to collect and make these things accessible. And what's really sexy for the museum person, um, and the carrot for us is, is being able to jump and make these connections. And the example I frequently use is I went to Kalamazoo College, a small private liberal arts college, and my art history professor had her slide files, her, her slide drawers. And the exciting thing about Billy's slide drawers is they were built for her. And in the Leonardo section, I would find all of the New Yorker cartoons that had ever dealt with the Mona Lisa. And when Billy retired, they jettisoned the slide collection. Um, because the images were available elsewhere, but Billy's connections weren't available elsewhere. And um, what worries me in what worries me in the in the, the fast push for museums, particularly for smaller museums and medium-sized museums, is um, this uh, the generation who doesn't feel like they want to have to learn one more technology or 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 put all of this online retires, and we lose those connections, that historical um, that place, that story that they've told. So there's sort of a fabric to this all that we have to make sure we don't lose. David, any thought on, on yeah, what's at stake if I, not a life? I, I would just flip this around and, um, and encourage us to focus on user behavior because we don't know enough about it and we don't study it and we don't pay attention to it. We make assumptions about what, how people should do their research or how they should learn or how they should use our materials but we don't know enough about that. If you really pay attention to where kids, and I'm talking about college students, get their information, first line of defense, Google, all right? And I, you know, I grew up in Duke University, mainly, where, where we started getting a lot of pushback from the faculty about why aren't they using the books? Um, so, and we fought that, you know? I, my librarians fought you know, using only electronic sources. And I have come to the point, and towards my last years at Duke, and certainly at the New York Public Library, we got to get over this um, and make it happen. Get as much of that content out there as possible in ways that are easy to use. I'm talking, you know, I was invited to talk specifically about archives, even though my career has been all over the place. But I'm really concerned, especially about archival material, because it's stuff that people don't know anything about. And it is so rich. The material that is in the archives of these institutions and of the country are phenomenal. No one knows about them. The reason I'm sitting on the governance work stream of the Digital Public Library of America, thank you, Bob, thank you, John, um, is to get archives at the table to get those materials uncovered, explored, used, um, and celebrated in ways that they've never been before. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage us to think about learning more from our users about how they expect to find and use information. 
Yeah, it really strikes me as having been part of library archive museum discussions for quite a while now that there was a time when we were still talking about educating our users to behave in the way that we had organized ourselves and we thought they should behave. And it seems like good for us that train really has left the station and we really need to organize ourselves in the way that they want to interact with materials. And I think that's the gap we're, we're currently sort of struggling with. And I could see how that would be particularly challenging in an, in an archival setting. Uh, with my uh, graduate students in the convergence course, one of the things they have to do is go talk to people who aren't archivists, libraries, and museums and talk to them about convergence. And what the students invariably discover is the rest of the world thinks we've already done the job. Yeah, that's true. Let's, let's get some voices from uh, the audience in here. What do you think? What do you think goes seriously broken if we don't come together more? Wait for the mic, wait for the mic. Bob. Thank, thank you, I'm uh, Bob Darnton, the university librarian here. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Hickerson, and it has to do with your gas mask. But I'm, I'm trying to make a larger point. Uh, it seems to me if there is to be conversion, it's got to be on the um, electronic level. That's where we can bring together material that seems to be, by its very nature, uh, different, located in museums or archives or libraries. So that's one way in which we can make it happen. But I'm trying to imagine a digital image with the, your gas mask. It's what struck you, if I understand you correctly, was the power of the object. And it seems to me that in a lot of museums, that's what makes them work. I mean, the Museum of Comparative Zoology here w provided a great contribution to what we call our Open Collections Program because it had these objects. And yet when objects are reduced to digits, something is lost. Um, and so I feel myself that many um, museums have a unique contribution to make because they have the actual objects and that a generation that has become familiar with digital images is hungering for authenticity, the thing itself in all of its physicality. So how is it if we're going to create convergence by bringing things together digitally, which we all want to do, how can we keep that sense of authenticity? I mean, I have one suggestion, which has to do with curatorship, using curators as a kind of feedback loop that would um, reinforce the impressions of people who are exposed only to the digital images. But I'd be curious to know how you feel we can maintain that sense of authenticity while at the same time converging. I, um, I appreciate your, your raising that point because I would certainly um, not want people to interpret my sense of the importance of this convergence as being only um, in digital form. Um, the commitment to actually bring an art gallery into uh, the new building was on the assumption that people would, um, would walk among the materials in the space, uh, as well as the fact that we would also display those same images on the, uh, on the various image walls in the building so that in fact that, that one could have, have both. Um, there is a, a tremendous um, uh, visual effect and, and one of the other exhibitions which we did in that space was, um, was an, a, an exhibition of, um, uh, we have a um, um, Middle Eastern and South Asian textile collection and the textile collection includes a large um, body of, um, of Afghan rugs uh, and in fact includes a significant segment that are, are, are recent uh, war rugs. 
and um, some of them created during the uh, uh, Soviet experience in Afghanistan and some of them more recent. And at the same time that we exhibited a rug, uh, which was in fact a woven image of a, of a, um, uh, a is it Kalashnikov uh, uh, automatic weapon, we actually exhibit right along with it the firearm itself. And uh, once again, that experience of, of the object, but also the, the artistic representation of it uh, in a woven um, surface uh, was, uh, was a similarly powerful experience. So I, I feel that's very important. I do think that they, um, they run alongside of each other and they, and they in, 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 strange, in, in strange ways, and David's comments are very relevant to this, uh, at, at Cornell in, in, uh, in the Rare Books and Manuscript Division, we started in 1997. Every exhibition we did from that moment on, we actually had an online version that came up on the very same uh, day. And um, uh, you, you, Ithaca is a small town. You don't get a whole lot of people. You put a lot of effort into putting together a fantastic exhibition. Um, the online version allowed us to include material and more explanation and searchable capacity that the actual exhibit didn't. And we actually had a monitor in the gallery space. And it was fascinating to me that even at openings of the physical exhibition, we would have people also standing, looking at the monitors in the same space. And so I think that, um, that we, need to, uh, we need to be thinking of both, that we, and, and that one is, not, one is not the other. One has a tremendous capacity to bring together. It also has huge public accessibility capabilities and, and you know particularly in the academic environments we I, I, I feel for all the all the resources that are devoted to our attention that we have failed to, to reach out um, to that to that larger um, you know larger humankind worldwide and digital gives us so much capacity to do that but we should never, um, forget about and and here visceral is you know is the word that comes to me or in some cases um, the beauty of something we've seen reproduced um, you know a hundred times in one form or another in a printed uh, you know a printed art ca art catalog is not seeing the the painting um, but it is a it is a beautiful piece of work in and of itself and so we have this, we have this experience that goes um, way back. And, um, um, but I do think that one can experience um, some of the very same poignancy, particularly in written words, uh, in the digital environment uh, that one can in the, uh, in the artifactual world. And so it's, just, it's not a either or. I, it's, something, it's something that I think about every day um, because I wander through the rotunda and see the number of people who are lined up, more than a million, 1.4 million people a year lined up to see the Declaration of Independence. Now you can go online and find, find many copies of the Declaration of Independence, but it does not compare to standing in front of it and the emotional experience that people have in that space is irreplaceable. So it's something that, that I'm concerned about with all the other you know, 12 billion pieces of paper that I have to figure out ways that they can have that same kind of experience with things signed by George Washington or Abraham Lincoln telegrams or Annie Oakley's letter to William McKinley and all the wonderful things that are the records of the country. You know, I would say from the museum perspective is museums were paralyzed with fear and there are still directors who are paralyzed that putting things online is going to diminish this experience. And we have 20 years of research that shows that that's just not true. 
And um, you know, what one area of convergence I would love to see is I'd like to have a grassroots group of archivists to go out and teach curators how to write registers because a well-written register for a collection can make you, you have to go see that. And you know, there's an example at Harvard here. Um, when I first ran across the article, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the collection, the, the glass botanicals, you know, the flowers, nothing could stop me. You know, it didn't matter how many pictures of them I saw online or how much I read about the collection. You know, that the first time I ever came to Harvard, I wanted to do nothing else except see those glass botanicals. So, you know, um, archivists, a good archivist has the gift to soft sell interpretation that make you have to go into a collection. Okay, we got another question. Uh, Michelle Clunan, Dean at Simmons. So I think there's some very innovative things going on in the online space um, that take advantage of curatorial know-how and user experience. And I hold out the Brooklyn Art Museum as a great example. They know, like other major museums, that only a small percentage of people can come through the doors, but many more millions can uh, access the collections online. So what they've done is they've created experiences for their online users that are very curatorial. They have openings, they have um, exhibits online. So it certainly doesn't replace the face-to-face the -face experience, but it's another way to engage people about that museum. And um, they, in turn, will, I think, um, expose other people to the Brooklyn Museum and the other museums that are playing around with new approaches to user engagement and experience. I think that kind of complementarity between the online and the real world that we're already seeing will be sharpened even more once we have, once um, more advanced imaging techniques become even more commonplace. I'm thinking about uh, 3D captures of objects. Um, we've recently captured a, 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 a stone sculpture of a, of a Buddha um, using 3D technology. And it's the first time that you can really experience the relief carvings that are all over that body of that Buddha, front and back. Mm. And you can see them unwrapped. So you capture it in 3D in order to actually present something that's flat at the end of the day. So you can see the whole story that is carved into that Buddha flat. And while, and that's a beautiful example of that complementarity, I think, because the, the visceral experience of standing in front of that sculpture Obviously, it can never be replaced, but there's something you can get now in, by digital means um, that actually is really helpful for you to have, even as you're standing in front of that Buddha or as you're trying to deepen your experience or your understanding of that. So then the digital means become more of your, of your actual research material, which is, which is quite interesting. So I think we're just starting on that journey of really trying to figure out how do these things reinforce and, and uh, talk to each other. And in fact, op art objects have a lifespan. They're much longer yeah. than our lifespans, but if you're going to run uh, a million and a half people past the Monet paintings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you're going to shorten the lifespan of the Monet paintings. And um, the classic example is, I can't remember whether it's Stanford or Berkeley that did the wonderful um, 3D imaging of Michelangelo's David which is absolutely fantastic and great because Michelangelo is not secured by an earthquake mount um, to its pedestal in Florence, and it sits on an earthquake fault. So that may be what we have. I'll add one last anecdote to this, which I always find really fascinating. If you go to the V&A, there's a, pla a, a, a room that's called the plaster court. Yes. And you go in there, and you see all these columns and, and antiquities. I'm not a scholar, so I've, I've, my words fail me to describe this to you. Most visitors don't know that these are actually <laughs> not the real thing. These are reproductions. But now researchers go to the V&A to look at the reproductions because the real things outside have weathered poorly and you can see more on the reproductions now than on the real things. So there, there really is a, a really delicate play between the real thing and what we then capture of that real thing and how those can reinforce one another. I want to ask another question to the panel about motivation, if I may. Uh, that We've now sort of gone to the to the audience side and to the you know how do we serve our audiences better and and do them justice and these the stuff is already together we're not releasing the value and I think that's 
tremendously important. I want to go to the flip side of that, which is sort of internally, how do you incentivize your staff to actually make this journey? One of the things that was very striking to me uh, during those library archive museum workshops was that every place we went to, we actually asked, what are the actual incentives that are in place for people to work together? And without fail, there was a silence in the room and people realized there actually aren't any incentives. Everybody's very narrowly incentivized to succeed within their very, very narrow territory. But people aren't, at most places, incentivized to look beyond that. Um, so I want to I wanna ask you about that a little bit. Um, what are the incentives that we could create internally or that you already have created as you've, as you've walked on that path? So one of the things that, when I was talking about the Open Government Initiative, one of the things that has helped me in, in answer to the question is this mandate from the president to think of new ways of collaboration. That doesn't Collaboration, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and and the, the mandate to report back, so what are you doing differently? Um, so it's collaboration internally, so it's forcing the staff to work together in ways that they've never worked together before. But also the participation thing is huge because of the, this user behavior thing I was talking about. And we have an enormous citizen engagement um, initiative underway also. We have a citizen's archivist program where we're tapping the expertise of our users in, in, in doing the work that we're doing. And the third thing I think that has been contributed mostly to this has been our um, embracing um, social media the use of social media within the agency in ways that has never been used before has brought people together in, uh, to do their work in, in um, very interesting and creative ways. And, and has antagonized, angered, and um, <laughs> otherwise made um, um, some people very nervous and upset. When I arrived uh, two and a half years ago at the National Archives, I discovered that there was a social media working group meeting in secret um, <laughs> <laughs> because they hadn't been authorized. You brought them out of the closet, huh? I, I found out their schedule and showed up at one of their meetings and it was like, <laughs> like they were busted. <laughs> we, had a, we had a great conversation and um, they have been doing extraordinary work. I'm very proud of them. Great. Other thoughts on incentives? Um, uh, a sort of disincentive for curators um, in the physical space for the past 15, 20 years has been studies that show that most visitors don't read labels. And so many museums um, limit their curators to 50 words on a chat label, and I don't know any curator who can convey the passion. It's very hard to convey <laughs> your passion for an object in 50 words. And so if you can show them how you can leverage the digital environment to let you tell the story you've been waiting your entire life to tell. I think that's, I think that's a, a real incentive. 140 characters. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one, I can't help but go back for one, one bit of answer to the, to the question before, which is, um, is that it, on the question of artifactual versus digital is is that uh, we're at the point in time where most is going to be digital so that we should um, and in fact a lot of it is going to be real-time digital and so for libraries and archives and for museums in fact the world of the collection is going to be something entirely different and, and so, um, so whatever we're thinking about today, we actually need to be focused on tomorrow. And so I'll use this as a lead into my, uh, uh, into the answer response to, this, to the most recent question, is, is that if we really are going to work in the 21st century world, um, these divisions aren't going to exist in the world out there. Um, it will all be a body of material, not all, but much of it, um, that is uh, created from electrical charges. 
and some of the most beautiful and most striking and the most amazing works of tomorrow and the days thereafter will be born digital. So what we're really doing is actually moving into a world where those kinds of differences will have uh, a, a very different meaning. So for our staff, uh, as we go forward, it's actually giving people an opportunity uh, to look at the curatorial world of tomorrow as well as the curatorial world of today. Now, uh, that doesn't mean everybody wants that world to be there, curatorial or otherwise. Um, but in fact, that's not, a, that's not the world we live in. The fact that we're in this room right now means we're in the 21st century. And that is just a very different environment. And all of our holdings will be different because of that. Um, and it says that, in fact, very few of us, regardless of where, are actually well trained to deal with that spectrum of kinds of information and information representation. Um, and so, to some degree, regardless of which uh, title you have after your name, we all have a very similar challenge uh, as we move forward. And um, uh, so, to some degree, we are in it all together. And that may just make the challenges for each of us equally demanding. But in fact, there are many capacities and, the, and, the, and not technical technology, but the technological vision of how to realize that in a data-driven world uh, is something that, in fact, all of us will be able to learn in common about. Uh, and, and, and use tomorrow. I'll, I'll share very briefly one experiment uh, that is currently happening at the Smithsonian to try to bridge the gap between the 19 museum, however many research centers we have, I think it's nine, uh, library with 20 branches and countless archives. And it's really interesting. We've basically declared in the strategic plan that we have four broad themes that we as an institution want to make a difference on, and they're valuing world cultures, the American experience, uh, sustaining a biodiverse planet, and exploring the mysteries of the universe. And uh, these now get organized um, as consortia that cut across the, the institutional boundaries of the libraries, archives, and museums, but also particularly across the museums, which are all uh, organized very separately with their own boards, uh, and so on and so forth. And in order to access the funding through a consortia, you have to show that you're working with colleagues who are not at the same, at the same unit that you are at. And that's really opened up a lot of avenues for, for discussion. It's been a very interesting, interesting model to try to bring people sort of out, of out of their more narrowly defined sphere of work. So I want to ask a question of, of the audience to wrap up our motivation section. I'm wondering. She has a microphone. Oh, there's somebody. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. No, that's okay. You gotta stand up and holler at me sometimes. Violet <laughs> okay. uh, yes. Ranovsky at Jamaica Division of Harvard. A um, few comments. First, of oh, what you are. Oh, First, for the uh, comment that question that you throw in the air, what will happen if we're not going to be integrated? Uh, I want to go back to the mandate that we, as a memory institutions, archive, museum, and library, got from the society. We are in charge of documenting the human experience, the human knowledge, and, and we, in fact, what we are doing is allow, A, collecting it, B, uh, allowing access to it, and, and preserving it for the next generation. By not doing that, by not working together in a way that we make each of those steps uh, for the people who are using it, you're, you're basically sticking the wheel of research. Because what you're doing is you're not allowing a, a new opportunity for new research to emerge because you put critical mass of materials under one roof. Allowing people from different interdisciplinary, from different disciplines, to work on a topic, on a concept, by making this information available in, in a different format, different type of uh, discipline, 
by making, creating opportunity of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, for research. Uh, it's, uh, it's not only uh, uh, putting stick in the wheel of research, it's also uh, uh, betraying your mandate from the society. It's one thing to collect, and another, and which is also a, a, a huge topic that we, we didn't touch yet. We're talking about hidden treasures, what we already have. But not making it available, it's not, it's not an option, really. It's not doing your job. That's what it is. Thanks. I would, I would just like to expand on that, because it's not, for me, it's not good enough making it available. Uh, and that's why I was careful to say encourage the use of. I think we have a responsibility, at least I feel, sitting on the government records, to encourage the use of them. The only way we learn is from our past. And I'm convinced that many of the problems that we're dealing with today as a nation, um, we would be better served if some of those folks sitting up on the hill would come and explore the records for how we treated this situation in the past. So yeah, it, it's to encourage the use of. So, quick question. Oh, there's another comment. Uh, Greider Trinkus Randall. I'm at the Preservation Specialist at the Board of Library Commissioners. I'm also currently the president of SAA, Society of American Archivists. I'm actually going to challenge the uh, panel and actually all of you uh, since um, you're here at Harvard um, and that is in Tom particularly in really and Tom and I know each other for a long time back uh, in looking at the institutions at which you work and what resources you have compared to the resources that exist in 90 percent of the institutions in this country and I agree with Tom, we're moving in the direction very definitely of digital collections, whether they're digitized or whether they're born digital. But the majority of the collections in, these country, in our country can't do that. The other thing is, I would say, step back a ways. Where does the education come? How does education deal with this? We're in silos, as the title of the session is. We're in silos in our education. We're in silos where you get your positions. I started as a librarian, got archives administration, went into preservation, and spent seven years working in, in museums. So I've worked back and forth with all of them. But I think the problem in many ways is, and I challenge all of you to that same factor, is how do you move people at all institutions, not just the National Archives, not just at the University of Calgary, not just the Cleveland Art Museum and others that you've been at, but how do you move people across the board to think of it? A lot of good comments have been made here in relation to, yes, we're all collectors, and yes, we're thinking about making them available to people, and how do, we, how do the users want to use them? But 30 years ago, working at the Peabody Museum in Salem, we started developing an online catalog for the a database for the artifacts. And the question I raised at that point is why can't we include the archives in the library in that same database? Oh no, that would be heresy. We can't do that. There's no way to do it. Well, there is a way and it's in our minds. We were talking earlier about what's the difference between the archives collections, the library collections, and the museum collections. It's in our heads. And that's where we have to make the changes. Thanks. You guys want to respond to that? <laughs> it's all in your heads. <laughs> well, as um, the, the American Association Museum has something called the Standing Professional Committees. And um, as when I was chair of the Media and Technology Standing Professional Committee, uh, we had a woman named Angela Spinazzi do a survey working with the Small Museum Administrators Committee of the major technology needs of small museums in the United States. And most of the museums in the United States are small museums. And the three major needs that they identified was they needed to learn how to use Excel spreadsheets. They wanted to learn how to use their voicemail. And what was Adobe Photoshop? <laughs> you know, it's hard to talk about 
putting your collections online when your vast, the, the vast amount of your public and needs to figure out how to work their voicemail and has a staff of three or four people. And so, you know, one of the things that's necessary, is it in our, is it in our heads to, mill, to build the collective and collaborative tools that will, that will bring the small organizations, archives, libraries, and museums up to some kind of parity with our, our big institutions? I would, um, I would, not to put you on the spot, Dean, um, <laughs> But I was at uh, a terrific meeting at Elise. I've never been to Elise before in my life, but I was uh, invited to give a presentation there and, and sat in on a session just before I spoke. And I was encouraged by the conversation going on among uh, library school faculty uh, members about this convergence. And so could you say a few words about what, on behalf of the uh, <laughs> library school education world? We need a mic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting activities going on. Interestingly, in North America, there's only one LIS program that has museum studies in with it, and that's the University of Toronto, mm. and they're not working together yet. So, you know, first you get them in a building together, and then you hope they'll mingle in the hallway. But, um, but actually, um, we're launching something at Simmons in um, what we call cultural heritage informatics. And we already have the individual courses, but we're trying to make it a, a concentration. And there are a handful of other schools. And I think it's mostly the schools that have strong archives programs, because they've already worked through the archives and uh, libraries. Um, conversions, if you will. And so those schools are the ones that are tending to bring in the museums into the fold, too. Museum studies is sort of a strange animal compared to our field. There's no accreditation. They can be undergraduate programs, they can be graduate programs, and they can be 10 courses, they can be three courses in some places. So uh, I think that we have a great opportunity here because we do have accreditation, we do have standards, and we do have the ability to give people credentials. We, we're also better set up to do post MLS and lifelong learning in this area. So it's happening. But you know, so then our grads go into a field and, um, and where the curators and the librarians don't necessarily work together in that way. So I think it has to come all the way through from when students enter our programs, and there's great enthusiasm for it because the students in our program are mostly 23, 24, so they're, they're beyond digital natives even, so they're already thinking that way. They don't necessarily even see the differences between these institutions. Because some of them will have never set foot in an archives before, but they know that they can get these collections online. So I think it will happen and I think Harvard's in a great position to show leadership in that area by, um, by creating some of these changes for the rest of the profession. So, so because it's in our mind, um, then in fact, every one of us can contribute to changing it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the mindset you walk into your space tomorrow with. And our peers will be influenced by our thinking. Um, uh, new members of the staff, um, new benchmarks for success. Um, it's um, in fact being in our minds is actually is is the is is the best thing because that in fact we can change our vision, our perspective. Um, I am sure that everyone in the room has some appreciation of the particular pluses that this evolution could provide. But I also think that it will happen in ways that we don't see as well. Interestingly, at this, the, the conference that I referenced at, at um, Cold Springs Harbor, um, there were um, bioinformaticists. Um, and um, this particular, in this particular instance, she held a, uh, um, I forget the field of biology in which she held a PhD, but she also had a, uh, 
uh, had an MLIS, and, um, and she saw herself working right in the middle of that field. Um, I, I, uh, a colleague uh, at, uh, former colleague at, at uh, Cornell uh, by the name of Tim Murray, um, who was actually a Shakespeare scholar, uh, runs the uh, Golson Archive for New Media, uh, which is essentially about collecting new media art from all around the world. And I, I gave him a place to have that actually in the library. Um, but he needed a place, but he doesn't need much more than a place. Um, because, um, and so how did he move from, uh, you know, from English lit uh, to pass through visual studies to move on? As we see this interdisciplinary world, I think that in fact what we, the other thing that we need to do is to be open to our colleagues in the various disciplines um, outside who in many ways are doing curatorial things uh, and uh, that will not only change within our own profession but that in fact we're in an environment where interdisciplinary changes are going to bring other people uh, into our fields and uh, and we need to be open I mean we you know it's remarkable how the barriers we're able to to uh, create to you know to um, maintain a, a kind of separation and status um, that really is a, a, a status from the past. And so, um, so like, so it just being in our minds is actually, if that, if that were all there was, we could just change our mind, okay? Well, let's talk a little bit more about that. I want to switch us to the, to the next topic, which is obstacles. And before we go into it, I want to remind us that all obstacles are opportunities. Um, as we just heard with education, you know, we are on separate training tracks in a lot of ways as library archive museum professionals, but that is changing and it's a huge, huge opportunity there. So I, I, I'd like you to talk to me a little bit about what the distinctive nature is of libraries, archives, and museums and where you've seen the friction. And you can also talk to me about the flip side of that, is, which is where is the opportunity in that? You know, I, do, I do have a huge obstacle uh, opportunity that I was, just, I was just hoping I would get a chance to bring up today. And you're sitting right there, so I get to ask you, sir, because in doing the research for the committee, Joint Committee for Archives, Libraries, and Museums, which has been in existence since 1970, never once has the um, head of the SAA. Let me, let me interrupt. Yes. I was a chair of that committee. That, but, <laughs> but never once have I been able to find a record that the head of SAA and the head of ALA and the head of AAM ever met or got on the phone and had a conversation. So if, you, if you've changed that in the past year, amen. <laughs> Just wanted to say that the incoming chair, our president of ALA, Maureen Sullivan, uh, and the current president, I guess, of AM Ford, Ford Bell. Bell, and I have already been in conversation, yes. moving to head to move with Calm to get it out of this level, but move it up here and start looking at across. I was thrilled to hear you say who had been there initially, but yes, we're moving with Calm, and we're going to look at uh, ways to get things starting at the upper levels rather than at the lower levels. That, my work here is finished. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, obstacle number so, so. one solved. What's the next one? Right. <laughs> well, I, since I really have uh, created some new organization uh, of what's called libraries and cultural resources, essentially organizing the, the, or, the um, um, the museum and the archives and the uh, and the libraries and in fact also the university press. So there is a there's a role for lamps, um, but uh, <laughs> uh, um, um, because I think publishing and dissemination is actually a critical piece of this. So I'm actually very serious about the lamp. But anyway, um, um, so we essentially organized. Um, the whole group around outcomes as opposed to around functions that were disciplinary specific. Um, and it's been a very challenging. Um, and um, 
and it's it's, it seems to be, in, although in different ways, equally challenging for everyone, um, and in ways that one might that might surprise you. Um, librarians, for all the kind of professional flexibility, which I sort of assign as one of the as, of the of the best traits uh, of the profession. Um, don't know very much about primary resources and incorporating primary resources into a kind of presentation about resources in an area is, is challenging for them. And they know what they know well, why, you know, and, and, and they can accept the principle, but yet it's a, uh, it's a stretch. And there's, and I, and, and in a sense there's more resistance than I would have, have imagined there. Um, archivists, it's the nature of the way they've compiled their information. They're, they're more, um, certainly more open Careful. to, pardon? <laughs> Careful. Uh, to, 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 <laughs> ah, to being, uh, to being, um, to encouraging access and, uh, and providing, um, Providing full, is he making fast faces? <laughs> um, is uh, um, at the same time they know so much about their material in a way that that uh, that's somewhat unlike librarians in far for the particulars, um, and so the fact that it can't all be conveyed in some fashion, that why we should just that that the users. That snippets would be enough. Well, the fact of the matter is, is the users don't care about more than the snippets, and they're going to bring things together in their scope of vision, based on very brief descriptions and not um, multi-page descriptions of the origins of those particular agencies, um, and uh, and and they uh, so the their progression is a somewhat different one. Uh, and they don't know very much about library searching tools and so forth. But since all you need to know is Google, you can get by. Um, and and um, curatorial staff, it's a it's a little bit of a different kind of challenge. I mean, in in the sense of of um, art or or other kinds of curators. Um, that world has has operated in a relatively, uh, and I'm sure that there are those of you in the audience that are the exception, but in a relatively autonomous fashion uh, in their institutions, and um, and that autonomy has overall served served them fairly poorly, because in fact it has not given them the resources to be in the 21st century world. Um, but, it, but they have been in charge of what they had. Uh, and that's a hard thing to give up, uh, is that degree of, of, of control of the environment in which you operate. But in fact, um, the resources are really needed and the idea of comprehensive knowledge uh, regarding their collections is something that is a relatively newly evolving sense of responsibility. And uh, likewise, I, I'm sure there are some of you that, that represent exceptions to that. Um, but the result has, has um, in spite of some, uh, the archivists love the summon implementation. I, I found that really uh, delightful, even though it didn't contain very much information about their various um, record series or poems as they're as they are in Canada um, but um, um, but I think it will be uh, I think we have to focus on the outcomes of what happens as a result of what we do rather than on what we do so uh, obstacles um, let me start with backlogs Enormous problem, mm -hmm. um, which leads to um, the, the second obstacle, uh, which one might look at as um, the 
it's not an obstacle at all, but that it's the gatekeeper mentality. Um, the archivist who's responsible for that particular record group is the best person to know what's in that backlog, what hasn't been processed. It's not public. You know, there's no way for a user to, it, it, it flies in the face of how users expect to find information. So if you have to go through a gatekeeper, which is the way when I started in, in, in this job um, back at MIT, that's the way special collections used to be, um, that you really had to go through the gatekeeper there in order to be successful in, in using, using the material. And then there's the, um, what I would say, the, the culture, and I'm, I'm just talking about my own situation, we're using processes and procedures um, that were developed when the archives was created in the 30s um, to process records based on the agencies from which they came. They go into record groups. And I've gotten into a lot of trouble with my staff because I was speaking at Catholic University and I, it was interpreted the archivist is doing away with the record groups. <laughs> <laughs> this is on YouTube. You can go and listen to it yourself. The archivist did not say we're doing away with record groups. But that never matters in Washington. You should know that. <laughs> the archivist said that record groups don't make a whole lot of sense to users. <laughs> and they shouldn't have to be forced to jump through these artificial hurdles to get to the, inf the content that they need. That was what. The archivist. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think oh, I was going to say also for museums, just to weigh in on having gotten that issue out. The, one of the things that that makes museums different are the fact that we have objects, and I know that a lot of you have objects as well. But we have a business model, a historic business model, that's not based on elitism as much as it's based on exclusivity. And so, you know, we pride ourselves on we're the only one that does this, we're the only one that does this, we're the only one that does this. So this sharing is complicated for us by that attitude. Plus, although you may have objects, museums, museums have this vast pyramid and we have these two competing demands on our time. We have to share and educate, but we also have to preserve. And preserving and conserving a Rembrandt is different from, it's not that you don't, I don't, I completely acknowledge your- You think your, it's more important, is that what you're I saying? I don't know, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think it's more important. I think it can frequently be more costly and require more storage and different, I, I, I recognize and I validate your need to conserve all your materials. I, I threw that out there because that's another one of the obstacles, right. is the attitude that my stuff is more important than well, your I stuff. Think you were, I think you were, no, I, I don't think it's more important, but I, you might even have been in the room. We had, the IMLS had a joint Canadian, um, a joint Canadian American dialogue at um, New York Public New York Library. Public, yes, yes, and I was there. And Ken Hama yeah. walked up, pulled a book off the shelf, and jumped on it. And nobody did anything, and he said, that's my point. It was if an I NUC. Did, it was yeah. a volume of NUC. <laughs> who, who the hell is going <laughs> to... And his point was, you get a very different response if we were sitting in the museum and he pulled, and he pulled something off the wall That's and true. jumped on it. So no, I, I absolutely <laughs> do not feel that your stuff is better than our stuff, and I don't acknowledge an R. I only acknowledge a we. Do we have a mic out? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, you guys, for this is a really illuminating session already. And I admit that I don't know the answer, but it's a really um, educative process that you're going through. Um, but I wonder if we might take seriously this question of obstacles for a second. Um, and to note that some of the obstacles are obviously dumb obstacles, but there might be some obstacles that are sensible obstacles. They're there for a reason and good reason. Um, and I may be wrong, and this is just trying to press a little bit. Um, Tom, you made this really great reference to interdisciplinary scholarship, and I figured since we're at the education school, it might make sense to, to invoke one of the great scholars here at the education school, Howard Gardner, and if you read through his books over the last 30 plus years, one of the arguments he makes is about the importance of interdisciplinarity, of course. But he says, before you get to interdisciplinarity, you have to have disciplinarity, right? And he keeps reminding us that, you know, it's fine if you want to be a lawyer who's involved in, you know, law or education or whatever, but you've got to be a good lawyer first. And then you figure out how to do these other things. Um, and I wonder um, whether or not there are risks in rushing to convergence of these three that we will lose some disciplinarity that we've developed in each of these fields. And maybe this is as much a question for Dean Clunan 
as anyone else, but what are the things that we need to preserve in the silos, as it were, as we seek to link them? Now, as David mentioned, this is a huge issue for the DPLA or anything else that seeks to be um, this kind of third way digital thing, is to figure out what to, what to maintain in the disciplines, as it were. So I have, a, I have a brief reaction to that, if I may, and then I'll hand it to the panelists. This is, I think that's very, very, a very apt question to ask. You know, how much do you have to get your own house in order first before you can invite over guests is basically <laughs> how you could phrase it. And um, the interesting thing about, though, thinking about inviting over guests is that all of a sudden you think about how your house looks like. And you may not have noticed that your house isn't in order. So this, this library archive museum convergence idea or just the idea of let's work more together actually really exposes a lot of the weak points that wouldn't have been exposed otherwise. And I think that's a huge, huge benefit it can, it can bring to us. What do you folks think? So, so They're deep in thought. The first thing I would say is, is we are moving at the pace of snails. It is not that we will suddenly, it's not that we're going to move from here to there we will move from here to there, one third of the way along in the, in the near future. So that in fact, that if we get started moving now, we'll actually learn those things along the way. It's not, it's not that in 2017, the world will be different. Um, and so one is, as I fear, unfortunately, we should not fear the rush. Um, <laughs> And and uh, so um, so so that that's just. But that, a it's interesting you choose that date, Tom, because <laughs> your archivist has declared that by 2017 there will be no paper. But in 2018, <laughs> it's <gonna> be, <laughs> it will be really different. <laughs> and, okay, I'll be watching. <laughs> So, um, uh, but I, um, you know, I think that in the, in certain fields in the sciences, um, there really have been some, you know, important movement uh, across the, the uh, you know, there is now bioengineering um, that is really one of the most important medical fields today. But the engineering is really engineering. It is really people that know about engineering and, uh, and technological manipulation of devices and tolerances and so forth, and uh, as well as visualization and so forth. So, um, so that kind of transition can happen here, but it doesn't mean you don't need the knowledge sets and the expertise. Um, that uh, and and you know I, I found that at you know at Cornell the um, the archives had over a million um, visual images. The art museum had about thirty seven thousand. Um, did we give proper care to ours as a result of of having so many? Probably not. But in fact we we did the best we could. And so it would have been nice if, in fact, we had had a photographic curator on our staff. You know, so, so it's not about doing away with knowledge sets. It's about bringing the knowledge sets to address the, set, the uh, common issues. Holly. Um, I think we need, uh, and since we are in an education, we need a much better definition and a much, uh, and of what critical thinking skills are in the 21st century and what we need to be giving the students who are coming through our, our various disciplines um, so that they can, they can meet at some level and have the discussions that they need to have. I think they're very, I think they're very bright and, um, and they, want, they want to see convergence and they, they like projects that allow them to get their hands dirty. And we all know if you've got any of the um, gen, Gen X and millennial students, that they want to do projects that make a difference. Okay, nine out of 10 of them don't in your class, but, 
but one of them really wants to make a difference, and you need to be able to give that student the critical thinking skills to be able to go in wherever they're going to go and make a difference. So I would, the way I would answer that, John, is, um, and I think this is couched in DPLA terms, that there's some space for us to um, identify that set of values from each of these communities that's important for us to ensure we carry forward. And I think that's a national conversation that we should have. Um, and I think it would be interesting and useful to see what the result is. Yes. Hi, um, Elizabeth Vernon from the Judaica Division in, in uh, Harvard Library. So up till now, this talk about the cooperation or lack thereof uh, in, in convergence in libraries, archives, and museums has largely been around access. And so my question would be another area, I think, where we have a real challenge, um, and in some ways it's been an obstacle in the past, has been in collecting. Uh, in if we're really to represent uh, the totality of the human experience and knowledge in a particular area, um, you really have to collect in a very broad variety of materials. And so I wonder if our speakers could comment in ways that they have dealt with those challenges in their institutions. So, for, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I, I don't have an institution, and I've only cried once at a student's paper, and it was a student from the New York State Office of Cultural Education, and she wrote about um, the New York State Museum, Library, and, and Archives, our division of the State Education Department. There's very little collaboration among the three program areas, um, and no institutional mandate for convergence. And she was talking about a project, um, the Willard Psychiatric Center collections. They, they got the Willard Psychiatric Center and in ex the abandoned psychiatric hospital, and they found a room oh. full oh. of suitcases. The trunks, yeah. We did trunks. an exhibit at the New York Public Library. Yep. Yeah, trunks and suitcases yeah. of um, individuals who died there, and there was just no one to return them to. And in the final analysis, probably when they came back from your institution, the trunks were not torn apart, but the books went to the library, the oh, no, objects really. went to the museum, really. and the papers went to the archive, and there's no yes. historical memory. And oh, that, <laughs> that seems to be one of the issues, you know, that seems to be our worst case, one of the worst case scenarios in collecting for me, over to people with real institutions. <laughs> So I was just going to say that for the first time in my life, this isn't a problem. Um, <laughs> I'm responsible for the records of government. And unless it was prepared by a federal agency or the White House, I don't care. <laughs> it's pretty clear. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can you say after that? Um, but, uh, um, so I'd say two things. Um, one is the process has been very selective. If we look, you know, if we look, if we go back to uh, cuneiform script and we have no, no way of knowing that that we do not know differently, but there's but it, there's every possibility that there was a predecessor to that. Um, but we don't have any signs of it. And we have very little of the cuneiform uh, tablets created, and we don't know how much or why the ones we have are the ones we have. And so, one, it's been a very, and, and uh, you know, the haves and the have-nots and the uh, indigenous history and the verbal um, societies, um, we, we need to remember that we acquire selectively and not encyclopedically. Uh, I don't know if there's an excited bit comprehensively. Um, and, and rarely and, collaboratively. And rarely <laughs> collaboratively. Um, so one is, is that I think we, I do think we need to focus on our collecting and think of it in this in this in this this broader sense, but one of the other great things about digitization uh, is that that we strangely haven't talked about very much today is that it allows us to bring diverse collections together.
from all over the world into um, a common whole and that people can contribute in a planned fashion or in fact they can contribute just by their material also being available out there. So that in fact we're probably in the process of building a different collection than we imagine today that is a result of the uh, digital instantiation of, of pieces of our collections, both past and, and future. Um, I don't think that answers the heart of your question, and I think that it would be very, um, you know, choose, a, choose an event and say, okay, what, I what forms is the record of that manifest in? And, and see what spectrum that actually includes. Um, you know, if we think about the shooting in Arizona, what, we're, what, what would be the nature of the record of that event? Um, and I think there, there's a lot that would say if we came to it from a multi-curatorial point of view, we would do a much better job than we could ever do by breaking it into pieces. Um, Steven's had a microphone absolutely. for a long time now, so I'll give him a shot at it. I'm Steve Chapman, I'm in the Law School Library, and uh, one thing right now as we're moving forward in terms of convergence, certainly a big area of investment and activity is data aggregation, definitely metadata aggregation. So I think the fourth entity is, is the aggregator. There's different types of aggregators, and I'm wondering about your thoughts about the agenda that we bring collectively and separately to aggregators so that we see this as an opportunity, not as an obstacle. Uh, there are ways that we can do this poorly by, you know, Gunter's metrics about efficiency and, uh, and, and the other things you mentioned. Um, but I, I think that the relationship with, net, with aggregators is a necessary partnership on the aggregation front. And again, how do we turn this into an opportunity rather than an obstacle? Real, real quickly, I'll mention a, a, an exciting development. I don't, uh, it'll be interesting how it uh, comes out and, uh, and is a slightly different mission than the one you describe is, is that the uh, uh, Libraries and Archives Canada, which is a combination of the two, has recently uh, uh, declared an initiative, uh, which is the Pan-Canadian Documentary Heritage Initiative. And it is actually an attempt um, to, in fact, bring all of the repository type institutions in the country together in developing through aggregation of the metadata. And the first project is a linked metadata project. So uh, it's, it's not bringing the collections physically together, but how do we build a whole for the country? Uh, and so there are some efforts underway on that and, and the value of that is, and it definitely is, uh, while it's focusing on, on library and archives, at this point in time there is definitely an interest in museum participation as well. Jin is actually doing that for museums already. They have for a number of years. So it'd be interesting to see whether they can all lash that up at the end of the day. On, on a larger issue, I was at recently at a, a, around aggregation, I was recently at a meeting with Cliff Lynch, the director of the Center for Networked Information. Um, in museums, uh, it is currently, uh, politically, it's uh, the word authority is a bad word in museums right now. And uh, museums are, are, are sort of in a backlash against your elitist institutions. You can't tell me we know about the stuff in the museum. You are very user-centric, and it's a pendulum that switches back and forth. And, and Cliff was pointing out that it, we really, at some level, we really have to stop and think um, with these aggregated searches like Google, where does authority come in? You know, how do you, what's determining what those top five links are? You know, what, de what determined, for uh, those of you, how many had an art history class in college? How many of you had Gardner or Jansen? Right, Gardner or Jansen, we're East Coast. The works come from East Coast museums. That's where the pictures were. That's where the photographs were from. That's where the art was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so aggregating, you know, it, as, we, as, we, as, we, as we aggregate our collections, you know, how do, you, how do we determine what's aggregated? Yeah, what is aggregate? 
one of the, uh, I, I hate to keep talking about the Digital Public Library of America, but uh, it is a massive, <laughs> it is a massive aggregation project. Uh, and there's a whole work stream uh, obsessing about metadata. Yep. Not so much the app and outcome of aggregation. There are, in fact, many different aggregating services that are out there, and they can be governed in a way that's for the public good, they can yep. be very narrow. So. But DPLA seems to be very broad. <laughs> <laughs> so that sort of brings me to a point where I wonder, in terms of you know framing it as an obstacle here, um, if we look across the pond what our European colleagues are doing. Um, they're very differently organized than we are. The, the culture and libraries, archives, museum, that entire sphere uh, very much is organized centrally and uh, through government and funded through government. Um, and uh, they have, therefore, a very, very different, very different system of carrots and sticks, and with the emphasis on sticks, on how to, how to actually <laughs> make things happen and bring these communities together. So my sense is over the last uh, three, four, five years, uh, the Europeans actually have gotten way ahead of us in that game. And uh, partly that is just because our organizational model in the US is extremely decentralized. Um, and I'm wondering, like people to tell I'm wondering, sort of how we can, within the system that we have, for better or for worse, um, how we can, quote unquote, catch up. And I think there is, again, a reference to the DPLA in that question, because I think the DPLA is arguably an effort to, to sort of bring us up to the standard that something like Europeana has set in Europe. Well, I, I would, I, I guess I would challenge the assumption that, that they've done it right. Because um, we've been looking at that very closely mm. to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes that they made mm. in terms of governance and um, stakeholders and, and that kind of thing. So they have certainly been a model for us, but I would say that we're going to be much better in, in, ter of course, in terms of our approach, <laughs> no, in terms of our in inclusive approach. Mm. Right, John? Right. <laughs> so talk to me a little bit more about that. So what, when you look at Europeana, where do you feel like their approach is less than optimal and how would you They've, they've it? Create, created a very, I, this is my words, and I hope this doesn't appear in the press anywhere. <laughs> Uh, I, I would say that they've created a, a kind of elitist uh, governance structure um, for the project, mm -hmm. which has excluded you know most a lot of the smaller, perhaps more interesting um, players um, that we're very interested in in, in in this project in the United States. Mm -hmm. And and it, there's a tremendous amount of bureaucracy um, that we're paying attention to. Right. Yeah. We have a mic out in the room. Yes. Yeah, I'm been trying to articulate a question, um, and it goes back to the DPLA as a reaction to um, the monetization of the of information access, and we everybody keeps referring back to Google as the portal through which all of our students and academics um, find everything. And so I'm just wondering how you, aside from the DPLA, which I has the word library, not archive and museum, but how you how you relate to, um, you know, speaking of users' needs and dr being driven by users' needs, how you relate to um, the issue of democratization of all of access to all of these wonderful things. And I, can I just, before I relinquish the microphone, and say I would take exception to your suggestion, um, Mr. Archivist, that, um, <laughs> that lives are not at stake. I think, you know, if you're talking about medical archives, if you're talking about bio, um, you know, biological research, um, there, you know, there can be medical discoveries that hinge on people having access to the correct information. And also, back to those amazing Afghan rugs with the um, Kalashnikovs and the tanks. If you, I, I saw an exhibit in Philadelphia of these rugs, and if you watch the evolution of the rugs 
from beautiful um, birds and flowers and so forth moving towards tanks and Kalashnikovs, um, you, you think, well, maybe somebody could be moved by an exhibit of these rugs or the gas mask with the painting to not make a decision to go to war, then lives would be saved. There's a lot of questions there. <laughs> you weren't having any trouble. <laughs> um, as far as the monetization of of uh, these resources. Um, um, one, I think that, that as far as, as Google or, or you know, Google uh, Scholar or whatever, we, we, you know, we live in the world we live in. And, um, and in this moment in time, that is a is a is a powerful device, and and I remember when, when uh, we did a, an exhibition of, uh, of political memorabilia, that actually was the well, immediately there after it opened up, our website became the was number one on Google uh, of an unsponsored entry, and that was like, I remember that day, you know that that was. And that was a kind of spreading of access to our material. And so um, most of, of uh, human industry, I won't say most, but certainly in the Western world, goes on through uh, a commercial uh, paradigm. And so the fact that a commercial paradigm provides access uh, to information uh, is, a, is a natural outcome of the of the world that we live in. And why would we, you know, to some degree expect any different from it? Um, and, and, uh, and that doesn't in and of itself make it, make it bad, um, because we certainly don't have a problem with a variety of other kinds of productions from corporate industry. Um, so why, why, uh, why isn't this an environment in which we would expect that that would operate and it has dramatically improved access to the range of our holdings? Um, uh, and the second point that you make about uh, authenticity and currency and so forth of access to recorded information, um, one of the things that I envision in the Right now, the question of what what do libraries, you know, and, it, and it's been at this point seems to be assigned to libraries. Um, um, what what do we do about research data in academic institutions, and what's the role of libraries in preserving that information and so forth? And um, and I actually think this is a moment in time where. Uh, whatever role libraries take, that the approach to research data actually needs to be an archival approach. Because I think issues of provenance and integrity and authenticity and um, an authentication uh, and versioning and preservation are actually things that archivists bring um, to the question of, of information management. And uh, when I think about the, um, uh, you, know, um, the you know, the online uh, patient record, which I assume will probably exist at some point in time, although it hasn't quite gone over, you know, come over the edge and it's probably delayed by the uh, current politics of the nation, this nation as opposed to mine. Um, and, uh, uh, and we are going to care a lot about integrity and authenticity and speed and accessibility and employing um, dedicated networks and so forth. So um, I, think, I think we information has always been crucial to, to human experience and so forth, but it now is going to be even more so because more things are going to happen in real time. And and we are going to need um, distributions that have integrity. Um, so, 
And some of those, some of those materials um, will in fact be in our repositories or should be in our repositories or we should be players in the system because once again we bring expertise. Um, I, would, I would just say that the DPLA content work stream is looking at this, is grappling with this um, uh, free versus pay um, content, recognizing the fact that there's a valuable material out there that we would love to include in this, but how, how are we going to accommodate the, the cost associated with it? And the, and the other, um, my comment about perspective about life and death was not based on my, my work. It's based on people who think the sky is falling because everything is a life and death situation. And I every day deal with records that are life and death situations. So um, don't confuse those two thoughts. And I think from the point of view of museums, <laughs> museums have, um, in the past 20 years, have very publicly um, overfunded interactives and, and, and uh, things that are public facing for special exhibitions um, and websites advertising our special exhibitions. And we've let the less glamorous cataloging and standards issues fall by the wayside. And I think this was nowhere made more apparent for the museum community than in the wake of Katrina when the Heritage Health Index pointed out how few of our cultural heritage organizations really know what they have and much less are able to take care of it or have a, a plan for um, any type of catastrophe. What I was trying to point out with the question about Google was more the question of Google as an obstacle. Um, I see that it's very useful and, that, it, it, and that, that your organization could get to the top of Google is wonderful, but my concern is more how do you interact knowing that Google, I mean, at the DPLA, I know it has some interactions with Google because of historical digitization projects and so forth, but to try to help Google, if that is going to be the default portal, mm -hmm. become a better resource so that the, the commercial constraints don't push what, we're, what users are actually looking for to the bottom, to the 25th page of and I'm, I'm afraid my I'm going to have to cut us short because there's a class coming into oh. the Zoom. Oh. So I'll, I'll ask, we discuss this, we continue this after lunch, um, and there's going to be brief announcements. Just some quick instructions for lunch. We're asked uh, to ask you to go, just follow the crowd across the street, and when you go into Gutman Library, take the elevator downstairs as opposed to the stairs. I don't know. I probably not because I'm sure that they have very strict separation of powers. Someone in charge of this. Someone curating. Oh yeah. So how long have you been? Five and a half years. So what should we be doing different? What? Are we doing? Yeah, are we doing what people would want? Yeah. Okay. The lunch is across the road, across the street. So how you guys would want to go to the restaurant? Yeah, probably would. I'll, I'll wait for you in the in the hall. Okay, I've got to, you know, uh, I probably I've got to make a phone call. Okay. Uh, and. Uh, so, so it's, it's are, are there washrooms yes. just out yes. here? <laughs> okay, and then I'll come across this thing. Okay, all right. You'll just save me a seat. Okay. So, we're, so it's going as you wish. It's going as you wish. The curator for my <laughs> The problem with the the um, No, we're we're doing great, I think. Um, we we only got two two of my four topics, which is fine. So I think we'll do vision after lunch and basically make that a more open discussion, which is perfect. I wanna find out what do I do with the uh, So it works. Yeah.
good, good questions. Okay. Hi, Jennifer. Do you know what I should do with the microphones around here? One, two, check, check, check. Well, no, it's funny because uh, I, I was kind of, you know, we're right in the backyard. So it's funny. One, two, check. One, two, check. I'm Jim Dandy. Oh, that's good. What was this on? Why were it? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, there he we're, is. Kind of, we're kind of in a hurry up mode yeah. because they yeah. had a whole crew in here. Got some, yeah. Who knew? Some glass glasses. You look like you just shown up in, right on time. Though. No, I was here earlier and I yeah. saw the place was yeah, packed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta get yeah, I just busted yeah, right on in. <laughs> I have a good idea too. I have an excellent idea where you no, can no, shove those. Look at this massive rubber band. Yeah. You know, I love this. Is I love things that are larger than normal. You could like that. <laughs> Glasses and ask for the stage. It's belong to TLC. Ah, okay, because I have to move the table and, and I have a place for the glasses. Okay. This is lab one, check, one, two, one, two, check, check, check. One, two, three. Don't you do my job for me? Yeah, let me just try to teach you. Just step on my toe. <laughs> Put them in the deep copy. Yeah. 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 
Cussive sounds. Check one, two. Should I open this? No, no. Okay. Well. Wait, no, I, yeah, I was yeah. just wondering if it would be easier. No, and so this is the power button. Just turn that on when you're ready. Okay, that's okay. it? Yeah, how you been? Good. How about you? I got three kids. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> you're See busy. this thing right here? Uh huh. <laughs> This thing is developed like in the uh -huh. kid number three. How old are they? We got two two year olds and one. Twins? Yeah. That's so great. Yeah, we got twins. Wow. <laughs> We're blessed, so, cursed with I mean blessed with twins. Uh -huh. Are you uh -huh. are you using your laptop or are you using a um, thumb drive? Yeah. yeah. How are you? How Whatever you call so it. So good to see you. Yeah. Too. I'm really looking forward to your lecture today. Uh-huh. I'm looking forward to the theme. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Yeah. Are you going to need the um, crowd to participate at all? Yes, this is going to kind of be um, part sort of, you know, kind of informational, mm -hmm. story based, and then the second part will be workshop. Okay. So, so the thing, the reason this is asking that is because we just in order to make a good copy for the extension people to hear. So wow, they came up in different order, huh? I put them in date modified. Okay, that's up. great. It's T006. T006. Uh-huh. Where is that? Oh, it's right on top. This one. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh-huh. And um, then no, yeah, four four nine PowerPoint. Wait. Uh okay. development um, final. Is that so how come there are two of them here? Oh, this you have a Mac, so it created these oh, okay. nice little yeah, that's uh, it. Adult pointer files mm -hmm. that basically, yep. if you try to open them, they don't do anything. They Terrific. There. And do you yeah. have my clicker? Yep. Right here. Oh, you have your own clicker. I'll just try. Okay. Uh, and will this stay? Will this stay live? Mm -hmm. So it won't fade out. No. It's so good to see it's you. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I think Jason's going to let me I'm clicking right way. now. You're clicking? That's, uh, right so is advanced and the other okay. one's back. And the other one's back? Yep. Okay, great. And then you got a little laser pointer. Uh -huh. Okay, various. I'll get used to this one. Do you, you can use your yeah. own. No, set yours up. I think maybe I should use my own just because okay. I'm a creature of habit. That's fine. That's okay. So the thing we're trying to figure out is this ever a point where they're going to be talking long enough to the Okay, this 
Awesome. My little teddy bear. Yeah. All right, good to see you. Good Have to a good see one. you. Water. I think I might need a, a second water. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's your water. Uh-uh. You have a chair. I don't need any water. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Are you sure? It's okay. No. Do you know? Do you know how expensive these are? Really? Oh, yeah. You have one in your office? Wow, a thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay, so you are all set. You have everything you need? All set with that one. Thank you. I will introduce you. Okay. Yeah. It'll, it'll be another five minutes.
Hi. Hi, Bob. I'm Ellie. Nice it's to meet you. Are you from technology? Yeah. <laughs> ah. I have No thanks. No. Sorry, you wrote it over. <laughs> okay. And you all set for everything else? I think so. Jason helped out. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for asking, Bob. Whoops. Good afternoon to you all. Welcome back from your holidays. Hope they were good. Um, you're in for a real, real treat uh, this afternoon. We have uh, an honored guest, uh, Professor Ellie Drago Severson from Teachers College, but it's also like a home homecoming. I could say this that actually that Ellie's probably the only person in this room who has at one time or another been in it, probably every role that any one of us have been in. If you were a master's student at the ed school, so was Ellie. If you were a doctoral student, so was Ellie. If you were a teaching fellow in the course, so was Ellie. If you're a faculty member at the ed school like me, so was Ellie. So she's, she's uh, seen it all, but she not only has done it all, she's done it all really, really well, and she has uh, spent a good part of her professional life kind of devoted to thinking about supporting adults' development, especially adults in the context of schools. And um, she's going to um, share some of her work uh, with us, talk with us for a while, and then, you know, put us to work kind of in the, in the tradition of uh, many of our sessions. So um, thank you so much, Ellie, for making time from your busy life to be here. I'm happy to introduce you to the students of this year's uh, T006 class and uh, by extension to all the folks who will also have a chance to learn from you who are taking the course through extension. Thanks very much for being here. So um, can you hear me okay? Is this working? Yes. So first of all, I just want to say a big giant thank you to you, Bob, for inviting me 
to your class. I really appreciate it. And I trust that all of you know how lucky you are to be in Bob's amazing presence. He's an extraordinary human being. And I can't even say the ways, many, many ways in which he has influenced the kinds of contributions I can make. So thank you so much. And I also want to say hello to everyone at the Extension School. Big warm hello to you and to all of you. I have been looking forward to being with you for such a long time. And um, I feel really honored to be in this space with you. And I am hoping that today is meaningful to you both personally and professionally. Um, so as we move through the day, I'm hoping that you're not only thinking about the other adults that you might support in your lives, but also thinking about yourself and how what I call this new learning oriented model might um, have practices that you can use to support your own development as well. So um, we're going to do three things kind of today. The first is we are going to learn about what I call a new learning oriented model that has four pillar practices. And I know that you had a choice of reading two chapters. Um, the four pillar practices are teaming, providing adults with leadership roles, engaging in collegial inquiry, and mentoring slash developmental coaching. I'm gonna spend um, half of our time together, we'll be talking and thinking about those practices, what they are, why they are actually developmental in nature, how they connect to the kinds of things you've been learning about, constructive developmental theory, um, and self and other people's growth. And you'll also have an opportunity to think about the ways in which they connect to the coaching process, which I've actually been watching some of your classes online, so I feel like I'm in it with you. Um, and then secondly, we're gonna, I'm gonna spend some time, since I'm um, imagining that you may have done some of the reading, um, thinking about um, stories from, from real life people who I kind of say, they, people always ask, okay, those, those practices sound great, but how do people actually use them when they're in schools and other organizations? So it's kind of the show me the money. So what I will be doing is weaving in examples from practice of real life people and both the successes they have and also the challenges in terms of supporting adult development in schools. And last, you will have a chance to apply learnings. And I'm gonna give you a choice, at a choice between um, actually implementing, thinking about how you might implement a pillar practice in your own work context. And you'll have a chance to think privately and then to check in with a partner, a, a consultant to you on your practice, that's one option. And a second option is to um, read these three vignettes about adults who are talking about the ways in which their coach is helpful and unhelpful to them. And that second option is gonna be on green paper. Um, it's a chance to integrate constructive developmental theory, the ways in which we make sense of our experiences, and to think about if you were the person responsible for supporting that person's growth, what pillar practices might you use and what kinds of supports and challenges might you thread through them to help that person um, both in terms of feeling well held in the psychological sense, meeting them where they are, and also kind of standing at the edges of their thinking in the developmental sense to push them a little bit. So those are the two options that you'll have. And I will keep revisiting them and reminding you of them so that you can be thinking about them before we actually engage in that process. Does that make sense to you? Yes? Okay. Okay. So um, there are a couple of big ideas that I thought I would just put out there before we get into the pillars. This um, workshop-y class, Bob told me that you love to do things, so that's like gonna be half the class, is really about bridging theory and pillars to your own work. Um, it's also about uh, internal capacity building. And for those of us who are viewing this online, um, all of this material will be uploaded so that um, the people online can also access and make sense of the kinds of exercises we're gonna experience. Okay, so I know that you are coming in from um, your, your other lives and there were some of us celebrating holidays this weekend. So I'm gonna give you a minute to just kind of think about this particular context, this class, which is about using pillar practices and to center yourself around this question. 
If you had one big hope for your own learning today, what is that? When you think back about what you read or what you were thinking, you know, one thing you'd really, really, really like to get out of this. And just to give you a signal as to what we're going to do, we're going to quiet the room and you'll have a chance to either free think about this or just kind of jot down some notes about your one big hope for today. Um, and then I'll give you a minute to check in with a partner. And I will be um, letting you know when we're nearing the one minute by chiming, okay? Okay, so this is a quiet moment just to think about that very question. Okay, if you could finish up your thought, please. And I'm inviting you to kind of check in with a partner, maybe about a minute and a half all together, and share anything that you feel comfortable sharing about one big hope that you have for your learning today in this class, please. Okay, so I'm going to ask for a few volunteers. 
Um, if you're feeling like there's some thread that kind of connected both you and your partner in terms of a big hope, or if you have a big hope that you'd just like to share with us, we'll take a few before we move on. And this is doing two things. One, it's giving me a sense of, just to make my thinking transparent, it's giving me a sense of like where you are and what you need. Um, so I'll try to kind of thread your hopes through today. So would anybody like to share out loud? Yes, thank you. Um, in a school setting, for instance, at a faculty meeting, let's say, mm -hmm. um, my hope would be that I can um, accept the person, because there's always one in every crowd that disagrees with um, my recommendations or my ideas. Mm -hmm. But it's not just disagreeing, which I think I can handle. It's simply the way that people behave, in, um, mm. in, not in a very nice way. Mm -hmm. So it's a, I find that difficult mm -hmm. to, to accept mm -hmm. and to deal with. Thank you. What is your name? Uh, I'm Rosalia Miller. Rosalia, thank you. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Um, I work in adult um, education, and my idea, my hope would be that I would get one exercise, one concrete pillar exercise that I could apply in my setting to stimulate development. Okay, great. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Sophie. Um, I'm, Hi, Sophie. A, I'm a pre-K to grade 12 school principal in uh, the middle of nowhere, Canada. And it's a really <laughs> small school and uh, it's hard to do professional development with uh, such a small school staff that are each dealing with different levels of, of students. Um, it's hard to engage everybody and so I'm hoping to get some clues as to how to do that when I return next year. Okay. Thank you, Sophie. Maybe we'll take one more. Anybody? Um, this is maybe a similar question um, to what Rosalie said, uh, but the, Rosalia, was that your name? I'm sorry. Was the idea of um, taking that person who has sort of like a negative attitude or like, I call them sometimes the bomb thrower, who just uh -huh. likes to say something controversial and then not speak again. Mm -hmm. um, and, <laughs> and how to invite um, a conversation with that person mm -hmm. to show that you may respect the, the place that they're coming from and turn it into positive work. Mm-hmm. And what is your name? Paul. Paul? Paul. Paul. Yeah. Paul, thank you. Do you work in schools? I do. Uh-huh. As? Uh, a teacher. Uh-huh. Yeah. Great. Okay, excellent. So um, if we had more time, we would, we would take more hopes. But for now, we're going to move on with these hopes and um, into the work. So just in terms of um, looking back to where you were, what I know in terms of making connections is that you have spent um, a lot of time working on the immunity to change map and thinking about yourself and your own growth. You've also done some experiments, right? You um, have also had a chance to coach someone else a little bit on their map. So that's supporting other people's growth through that. Um, and today, we're going to be thinking about connections between constructive developmental theory and the pillar practices. And I was thinking last night that it's sort of like we've heard of all these terms before, teaming, providing adults with leadership roles. And you might be thinking, well, you know, we do that all the time. The difference, though, is that um, these practices that we're going to talk about today are actually sort of as their DNA, or at least part of it, maybe the D in the DNA, maybe even the N, is constructive developmental theory. So it's all about thinking about how, as adults, we make meaning in very different ways. And what we need in order to grow also varies. And that's what we're going to be talking about in relation to the pillars. Um, and then you'll have a chance to apply your ideas. So I, I hope that um, you find this meaningful. If at any point in time, you feel like you have a question that's actually stopping you from listening, like you can't even listen to what I'm saying, that's the kind of question that you should just like raise your hand and jump in with. 
If you have other questions, I would invite you to please like jot them down so that we can make the most part of the sort of lecture information giving part of our time together. And then at the end, we'll have a space for questions. Does that sound OK? Yes, I see nods. OK, great. OK, so I thought it might be helpful just to say a little bit about me and where I come from. And um, as Bob said, I've sort of had every role or many roles um, here at HGSC. But before that, I actually was a middle and high school teacher. Um, I taught math and science, and I designed um, a program for adolescents and pre-adolescents to talk about things that really mattered them that, to them out, aside from academics. Um, so it was kind of like a sex ed teacher, basically. Um, and one of the things that I noticed in working in schools was that it seemed to me, and this was a long time ago, um, that when the adults felt well he held by the administration, that that had a very positive impact impact on the kids. And the opposite was true. So I came to graduate school with a question, why is it so hard to support adult development in schools? And um, what can we do to make that better? And that's kind of been my life's work for the past 24 years, helping not only myself to do that and to learn from leaders like yourselves, but also helping other people to create the conditions that can support adult development. So that's what um, we're going to talk about today. Now I'm going to give you a quick moment to kind of zoom in when you think about one practice that works well for you or for other people that you use to support growth. It doesn't have to be a pillar practice. It can be anything. What is that one practice, and why do you think it works for yourself or for other people? And this is just a space to kind of consider that question. Does everybody have one? Yes? OK, then we're ready to move on. OK, and I'm going to invite you, first of all, before we dive into this, to close your eyes, and I really mean it, including all the teaching fellows and Bob, if you would, please. How often do we as adults get a chance to close our eyes while we're in class? <laughs> I really mean it. OK, so I'm going to ask you a couple questions just to get a sense, take a temperature on, um, on where you are. Um, how many of you, of us in the room, had a chance to do any of the reading, at one chapter in leading adult learning? If you could raise your hand and please keep your eyes closed. Okay, great. Okay, and um, of those of you who did have a chance to do some reading, how many of you read the chapter on collegial inquiry? If you could raise your hand, please. Okay, how about the teaming chapter? Mm-hmm. How about providing leadership roles? OK. And how about mentoring? OK, great. That gives me a good feel. Thank you. OK, so I'm just going to situate what we're about to talk about in the context of education leadership today. If you're sitting here and you're from the Kennedy School or you're watching from somewhere else in the world and schools have nothing to do with where you are, one key thing that we all have in common is that we all work with adults or have adults in our lives. So just by way of context, um, it has been proven now that supporting adult learning does actually increase student achievement. But the thing is, it's not just feeding adults information that works. It's actually creating experiences or creating learning spaces where they have a chance to um, think and talk with other people. That's what's been proven to work. Um, the second thing, and the reason why supporting adult growth and development is important in schools in particular, and I would argue outside of them as well, is because we have more and more adaptive challenges, challenges that require us to handle um, tremendous amounts of ambiguity and complexity. And the side that parallels that is that they also require us to have greater internal capacities. So in today's world, it's not enough to change 
as one of the um, network leaders in New York City said, to change the paper, we actually need to think about how we can help the person grow. Um, and we know that we can't do that alone. We need other people, and um, we need something to help us. And I find that these pillar practices and what you've been learning about to be tremendously helpful. So the work that we're going to talk about today is, um, stems from leading adult learning. Um, and that's a study, that's a series of studies that, in which I worked with and learned from a whole bunch of leaders who had different kinds of positions in schools. Um, and it, I think the ideas that we're going to talk about today actually apply regardless of context, whether you're in K through 12 or um, other kinds of work settings. So um, there are these four pillar practices, which I said, I'm going to give you a brief headline on what they are, and then we're going to go into each one in a little bit more depth. So the first one is teaming. Teaming was the number one practice that people use to engage other adults in sharing and decision making and in sharing the work. Um, we're going to talk today about how teams can actually also be holding environments for supporting growth of people with different ways of knowing. The second practice is providing leadership roles, which is quite different from distributed leadership. How many of you have heard of distributed leadership? Yes. So this is not about getting the work done necessarily, although that is important. It's, it's about um, recognizing someone's growing edges in the developmental sense and offering a role to them and also thinking about what kinds of supports and challenges they might need in order to grow from the leadership role as they're bumping up against their own limitations um, and different kinds of challenges as they accept it. Collegial inquiry is a practice, as you know, that's different than reflective practice because we can reflect on our practice all by ourselves. We don't need any other people to help us. Um, but for collegial inquiry, which is a purposeful dialogue around exploring our assumptions, beliefs, and values in relationship to the teaching, learning, and leadership process, we need at least one other person. And the last practice, mentoring, which um, is closely related in some cases, I would say, to developmental coaching, but not all, um, has become more and more prevalent over, since 1999, actually. Um, and now we realize that uh, we need more than one person as a mentor. In fact, the research shows that we need a constellation of mentors. And so we're going to talk about these four practices in relationship to um, helping adults grow. Okay, so I thought it might be helpful just to give you a few of, um, of the phrases that I use just so that we're all on the same page. So I know that, um, you know, ways of knowing for me, as, as many of you know from the readings, really has to do with developmental orientation, meaning making systems. So I'm going to be using the phrase ways of knowing, and I'll be talking about instrumental, um, stage two-ish, socializing, stage three-ish, self-authoring stage four-ish, and I'm not going to get into self-transforming today because I know that you will eventually in your last class go into that in more detail. Um, the second thing is that I'm going to try to deepen your own understanding of pillar practices as actual holding environments. Holding environments, as you know, serve three functions. Does anybody want to say what they are? Yes? I can hit at least a couple. Okay. Uh, the work and, uh, the stress. Uh huh. Okay, that's great. Thank you. What's your name? Rob. Rob. Thank you, Rob. So, Rob said pacing the work and regulating the stress. Yes, yes, yes. So, the first function is to meet someone well, just like in coaching. You're joining that person in their experience. Um, without an urgent need to make them grow. The second function is to offer some challenge, developmental stretching, kind of pushing a little bit on the edges of their thinking um, as, as a form of growth. And the third function is to stay in place while the person is growing to demonstrate these new capacities. Okay. So um, context and conditions matter. And so we are going to talk a little bit about that today. If I work in an environment where there's no trust 
and I'm trying to support adult development by using pillar practices, I need to sort of back up a lot to think about the conditions, or what we're calling now from our research, um, as preconditions that need to be established, trust, respect, um, collaboration, before you can even think about implementing pillar practices. And at the same time, pillar practices can be used to help you establish those conditions. Are you guys with me? Yes? OK, good. Um, so recognizing uh, that, as Sophie said, that there is developmental diversity. In other words, people have different ways of knowing. And in order to accommodate them, we need to create spaces that are roomy enough to both hold people with different ways of knowing well and challenge them in their development. OK, and that is the promise of developmental differentiation. We think about that all the time when we're working with children and working with adults. We need to think about that, too. OK, so I think I've already covered these things. So I'm going to move along, and they'll be threaded through uh, the practices. So I'm going to invite you right now, knowing that you're going to be doing an application exercise at, toward the second half of our time together, to, as you listen, to think about knowing what you know already about these different ways of knowing um, and knowing what you've read about the pillar practices, to sort of think about how, you know, in your own work context or life context, how you might pick up some ideas here today and bring both the idea and your form of differentiation in your own work context as we move through these pillars, OK? All right. So this is a taste. Um, if, if you haven't read the other chapters of Leading Adult Learning and you find these ideas valuable, you might want to go back to them at some point. OK, we are going to start with collegial inquiry because these four practices are actually intertwined and they are artificially teased apart. Collegial inquiry is something that happens in every single pillar practice. Um, and it's, as I said before, a shared dialogue around our assumptions, beliefs, and values. So um, successful leaders, and when I use the term leader, I'm using it very broadly and inclusively. Uh, principals, superintendents, assistant principals, and teachers all made, the, made space for collegial inquiry, which means pushing other things to the side. So that's a structure. Using a faculty meeting to actually engage in conversation is different than having a faculty meeting where everyone's just reporting out. So creating the space. How do you do that? How did they do that? Sometimes they did it by asking questions, knowing that the way that we respond to questions is going to be different depending on our way of knowing. So, um, and you can imagine different kinds of questions that might work well for people with different ways of knowing. For instrumental knowers, for example, inviting them to, you know, respond to a question that, that mostly calls for recall might feel like both um, a good support and inviting them to critique a little bit might feel like a good challenge. OK, so just inviting um, adults to kind of work together is not enough. Sometimes we need to set up structures. And one thing that can be really helpful is using protocols um, to guide conversations, especially in the beginning. Uh, Larry Myatt, who, who used to be the principal of um, Fenway Pilot High School here in Boston, um, one year decided that every Friday, teachers would have three and a half hours to work together collaboratively. And so in the beginning, he kind of walked around and went into their rooms and was trying to understand and be of help. He was looking to understand to see what they were doing and also to be of help to them. And he went into one department. Um, and there were five teachers sitting around. Two of them were grading tests. One of them was reading a newspaper. And the other two were on the computer. And he asked, genuinely and sincerely, what are you doing? And they said, we're working together. Working together in the same space. And one of the things that he realized was that he needed to help them learn how to work together. It sounds funny. But it's actually really true. And so using protocols can help guide conversations. Um, 
There are five different ways in which leaders of all types used collegial inquiry by inviting people to write in journals through prompts at faculty meetings, um, by engaging them in dialogue and feedback, and I'm going to say a couple of things about feedback from a developmental perspective, um, engaging them in decision making, and you can actually think about how do our different ways of knowing influence the way in which we might think about decision making. Is decision making more of an internal event or is it more external? Um, reframing the focus of faculty meetings was a big thing and in your leading adult learning chapter five, I have some protocols for how you might be able to do that. Okay, so, um, so knowing what you know now about collegial inquiry, and this is something that you might want to think about in terms of your action plan, one practical thing that you could do, how might adults with different ways of knowing actually engage in the process of dialogue? And to be mindful of the fact that some, for some adults, um, that process might be more of an inquisition, whereas for other adults, that process might be one that's really embraced and feel like a great support. Okay, even thinking about what is it that makes for a safe space to engage in dialogue. For instrumental knowers, for example, who are primarily very bound up by rules, um, having rules in place for engaging in dialogue would be very, very supportive. Uh, to stand at the edges of their thinking, um, just even the opportunity to hear different perspectives could be a developmental challenge. Okay, reflection. How often do we actually invite people to reflect? You know? A lot, don't we? And how do our own internal capacities influence the way in which we reflect? For instrumental knowers, there's not so much of an internal world going on, right? For socializing knowers, reflection um, is a little bit more internal, oriented toward their internal life and world. Um, for socializing, for self-authoring knowers, they actually have a self to, to judge their own internal um, and self-developed standards and values. So reflection looks and feels different. So in our work, when we invite other adults to reflect, it can be helpful to just kind of be mindful of that. Um, so I thought I would just point out a few things, a few practices from a developmental perspective that involve collegial inquiry. So the first one is um, goal setting from a developmental perspective. What is it that adults with different ways of knowing would need and expect if they were coming to you at the beginning of the year for an annual goal setting session? So for instrumental knowers, they might want to know what the right goals are for them to be achieving this year. And not only that, but they'd like to know how to actually do that. For socializing knowers, they might come in with a few internally generated goals, but they would look to you as their supervisor to help them figure out what are the goals they should be working on. For self-authoring knowers, what they might want um, is to have a dialogue. They have a set of goals. They'd like to hear your goals. Um, but in the end, they're going to be the ones who make the decision about what goals they're going to be working on. Um, just thinking about learning walks, which is a practice that we use a lot in schools, or observing each other's practice, if you're not in a school context. Um, the use of, I had this uh, teacher I was working with, and he was responsible for learning walks. And he raised his hand. He had been through you know, a couple of classes around the same kinds of ideas we're talking about today. And he said that he's having a lot of trouble because he feels like he goes on these learning walks with his team of teacher, teachers, but they're like not telling the truth about their practice. <laughs> they, you know, it's a show. And um, when in talking with him, I asked him why he thought they were doing that. And we talked some about it. And one of the things that he found himself doing was that he was a colleague and an evaluator. And his roles were getting mixed up. And so one of the things that they did um, as a team, and you know, he was doing this with groups of teachers, was develop norms for, and ground rules and confidentiality agreements for what happens during the learning walks. 
And then he also revisited those over time, and he also made clear to them when he was wearing which hat, evaluator and colleague. Okay. Um, the thing about developing ground rules and norms is that, you know, we might take it for granted, but it can really create a space that helps people, regardless of their way of knowing, to feel both well held um, and to know that that space is one where they can take risks. Okay, so what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna give you a chance to just take a minute to sort of reflect on anything that you're thinking about in relationship to collegial inquiry. Um, and then to share whatever it is you feel comfortable sharing um, with a partner sitting near you. Just This is a brief check-in, a chance like what, what insight, what question, what's puzzling, what, what's making sense to you right now in this moment. Yes. Well, the topic of power differential and that, that there would be fear and, and concern in the mix of when there's inquiry, how do you make sure, how do you create safety in a safe space, uh, a holding environment, if there's power stuff involved? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it speaks, it resonates with you. That's uh huh. Yes. Yeah, so that's, that, that, that is, you know, a very true. Um, fact that there is power involved and there's there are also hierarchies and we play different roles so that's sort of why leaning into creating like discussing that as part of the ground rules can be very very helpful and and I think about ground rules and norms as living documents and I've found that people really appreciate it when you revisit them um, and it, and to revisit the question of power and how it's working out, what's going well and what isn't working so well for us. Like engaging in that kind of honest conversation can be really helpful. Does that help? Yeah. Good. What is your name? Burkhardt. Burkhardt. Thank you. Okay, so did you check in with your partners? Not yet? Okay, this is your time. About one minute. <laughs> Quick check in. Uh, we're, we're not going to distribute them yet. Yeah, I can hear it. You can hear it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. It's hard to step in and just take over when, when the you know, body says things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I feel it. Yeah. I feel it. Yeah, so they're, they're just not used to it.
Thanks, Susan. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Um, you'll have, we'll have more time later. Now we're gonna move into teaming. Um, and I know that you've read um, a lot about teaming. I'm gonna say a few things that might be helpful in terms of um, enhancing your teaming practice from a developmental perspective. Um, so just thinking about what is it that would make adults with different ways of knowing feel safe, well-held, and productive in teams. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk a little bit about. So just in terms of giving and receiving feedback. Um, just by way of example, um, I, I was talking with this principal um, and he was saying that you know, one of the things that he learned after about three years of working on a leadership team was that he was giving feedback in the way he liked to get it. So he was very much a self-authoring knower and he just thought that everyone should get the feedback um, and take it in. And one of the things that he learned was that if he learned to differentiate the ways in which he gave feedback to adults who had different ways of knowing, that all of a sudden he felt like it made a tremendous difference. So just thinking about what works for us is not necessarily what works for other people and trying to differentiate the way in which we give feedback. Okay, thinking about conflict in teams, what happens for socializing knowers, just for example, when they're on a team and conflict sort of, you know, emerges? Or people are really, really having heated discussions about things. Or someone who's a socializing knower has been teaching at the school for, you know, 15 years and they have the most experience and the whole team itself is just tired of engaging in the dialogue. So they say to that person, okay, what do you think with all of your years of experience? What is a socializing knower likely to do in that case? I'm gonna answer for you, okay. Probably what? Rob? Well, I was gonna say answer the question. Oh, answer the question. You think so? Well, the person with 15 years of experience, you mean? Yeah. So may maybe the person with 15 years experience might tell them what they know, but maybe the person with 15 years experience is on this team, it's a cabinet, a leadership team, and the principal, the assistant principal, the department chair are all there too. And for a socializing knower, uh, he or she might have her perspective on what should be done, but the last thing that that person wants to do is upset any of those other people. So most likely that person would maybe um, try to figure out a way to present their ideas in, in a way that would not offend any of those people for whom approval um, is so, so essential. Um, so how do we create teams that can help each other grow? What, you don't know? <laughs> uh, it is possible. Um, and, um, and it's important because on teams, we want decision making to involve all of the perspectives. So one, one helpful, helpful practice is something I call checking in and checking out. Um, and you might think that spending a couple of minutes up front in a team meeting around checking in, just seeing how people are doing in relationship to a question, giving them a chance to free write, talk in pairs, talk with the team. You might think, oh, that is such a waste of time. The thing is, it's really not, because it's the relationships and the, the ways in which that kind of sharing engenders a context where people eventually, over time, can grow to feel safe to actually share their perspectives, to take a chance in sharing their perspectives, talking about how when we're in conflict, modeling that when we're in conflict, it doesn't mean that our relationships are ending. Does this make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so on page 71, there are, this is like fast forwarding into action planning, there are some protocols that you might find helpful in leading adult learning to help you not only to develop ground rules, think about safe spaces, but also to check in over time on what's working well and what could be improved. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you a quick minute right now 
to just think to yourself if there's anything that you want to remember based on what I've said to make a note of it. Um, and then we're going to move into providing leadership roles. So this is a quiet space. Okay, if you could just finish your thought, if you're writing. Okay, so providing leadership roles, um, as I said before, is different from distributing leadership. Um, and one of the most important things to think about is the goodness of fit between the person and their own internal capacities and the role itself. So for socializing knowers, one of the roles that can be a good fit for both holding them well, provided that they have someone to go and talk with about the limitations of what their own way of knowing and also the, what they're bumping up against, could be a role as a team leader. For a self-authoring knower who pretty much loves, probably, likely, the opportunity to sort of critique things, to um, present one's perspective, one of the roles that could be both a developmental support and a challenge might be the role of facilitator, where their job is sort of to bring diverse perspectives together. That's both a developmental support and a developmental challenge for them. Um, I was working with a group of coaches, um, this, is, this relates to leadership roles, in Harlem, and um, their principal had decided that these master teachers um, would be great literacy and math teachers. It was a uh, K through eight elementary school. And so this was the first year that these teachers were kind of dubbed coaches. And we met once a month over the course of a year, we read Leading Adult Learning, and we basically just had what I would call kitchen table conversations about the ways in which the ideas around constructive developmental theory and pillar practices were, if at all, helpful to them in their coaching of other adults. And one of the things that I learned that I thought might be helpful to share with you, and this is a direct quote, when I asked this group of eight coaches whether or not, you know, um, how their leadership was going, one of the people said that she didn't even think of herself as a leader, but if people saw her as a leader, then she could see herself as a leader. Think about the developmental implications of that, right? And I have worked with lots and lots of teachers and people who are new to leadership positions, and one of the things that I think might be helpful to know is that it's a process to learn to see oneself as a leader. And it's complicated when someone moves from a position of being a teacher into a different kind of leadership role. And they're trying to manage their relationships with their colleagues at the same time, be an evaluator, wearing those multiple hats. So um, giving people, it's not like, you know, you can walk into your organization, you have a bag of leadership roles, and you throw it out into the middle of the table, and you say, okay, everybody pick one, right? Because this goodness of fit between what is a person's growing edge, what would be a good role for someone who's an instrumental knower, might not be a good leadership role for someone who is more self-authoring. OK, and also just kind of, and I think that this sort of relates to um, Burkhardt's comment about power, it's also that as adults with these different ways of knowing, we take up our authority in very different ways and power and make sense of that very, very differently. So that's important also to consider when thinking about leadership roles. Okay, so my understanding is that at one o'clock you guys get a break, right? 
True? So um, what I'm going to do is, I'm, it's two minutes after one, so that means your 10-minute break will end at what time? One twelve. yes. So during your break, um, you might want to be free thinking about whether or not, and we will go through the last pillar practice as well, whether or not you would like to engage in the yellow exercise or the green exercise. Okay, so um, the yellow exercise is an exercise where um, you are going to be given the opportunity to design some practice based on what we've learned together today and what you've read and what you've learned in this class to implement in your own work context. And basically, you're going to decide what the, context, what the practice is, who you'll implement it with, um, and how you will infuse it with kind of a developmental orientation. That's the yellow page. That's on this side. So when you come back from break, you might want to decide which paper you want. If you want a yellow paper, if you could kind of place yourselves on this side of the room, that would be really helpful. Or if you want a green paper. A green paper is, um, for those of you who might be thinking, well, you know, this is more about um, vignettes of people with different ways of knowing and thinking about, A, where they are in their meaning making, and B, what kind of practice, pillar practice, would you employ to both um, support their growth and challenge it? So both opportunities are weaving together the ideas that we're talking about today and the ones that you've learned about in this course, but they have different frames. And I will reintroduce them when, you, when, when we get to them. But for now, this is just when you come back, please pick either a yellow paper or a green paper. Green's going to go on this side of the room, and yellow is going to go on that side. And I am available to answer questions. So we're coming back at 1.15 now. <laughs> Thank you.
have yes. a question. Yes. Do you truly came across a teacher that is in a second order? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes? Yeah. I know, she, okay. she, yeah, I mean, we tend not to focus too much on the second order, yeah. you know, in, in, in the class, right. but um, there's, there's more tuishness running around in the adults than we probably want to consider. Oh, it's okay. It, yeah, that, sometimes very like concrete, a, you know. How does that, like, I would wonder, have, have this informed, like, teacher hiring processes in a way? Because I feel like you have to somewhere at the four-ish in order to really manage a classroom. I know, but, but the majority of teachers are not. Uh, no, no, yeah, uh, and not that's a big problem. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it's a it's a that's a, a good issue. Okay. So quick yeah. check in. I think it's going great. Of course, it's time good. always is a yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank so, you. So I think we probably should do like, this fourth one like really fast so that they can get yeah, into yeah, it and not give them a minute to think yeah. about it and so on afterwards. You know, like you're doing for the other three. Yeah, I know. So let them. me. I, I know. Okay. So, yeah. How you have enough water? Um, yeah, do you want to okay, say anything? But I think any they're very engaged. In other words, I think it's going great. Yeah. You think they're very engaged? Can I tell you? I've, I've never worked with them. So it's, just, it's just how they are. Dim said the same thing. Really? Yes. It's a little overwhelming for them. Yes, they're, they're with you. Don't okay. worry.
Yeah, I think we're on now, right? Yes. OK, welcome back. Um, I'm, I'm looking around. Does anybody still feel like they need a yellow or a green sheet? No? OK, good. So um, I'm going to say two more things about leadership roles, and then I'm going to say a little bit about mentoring, and then I'm going to give you your workspace. Um, so uh, one of the other things to think about when giving out leadership roles is that, um, and this is a real live example, that uh, if you're giving them to teachers, oftentimes, and this is a true example actually, I was working with a principal in the Bronx and she's trying to build leadership in her school. And at the, at, on the one hand, she wants to give away the leadership and on the other hand, and now that you guys are all learning about immunity to change mapping, she thinks that she needs to be involved in all of the decisions and that she doesn't want to give up control. Anyway, she's still working at this and she has these lunches, lunch meetings with her team leaders of different grades and they have just recently become team leaders. And during one, she was like presenting the options for how they could work with their teams and one of the teachers raised her hand and said, well, I mean, do you want to tell us what we should do or should we delegate that to someone else? And what struck her was that years ago, about 20 years ago, when she assumed that role of teacher leader, her principal told her exactly what she wanted all the teacher leaders to do. And that was just the accepted culture. So this woman, Meg, now is trying to create a different culture. So that links back to how people take up authority differently in leadership roles and being sensitive to that. OK, I'm going to say a few words about um, mentoring or developmental coaching from a developmental perspective. And I know that you've kind of been immersed in this all semester. So um, one thing, ALPAP, the ALPAP example, that can be helpful is to bring mentors and um, mentees together to engage in conversations about these kinds of questions. What does mentoring mean to you? When you think about a good, effective, productive, safe mentoring relationship that you've been involved in, what were the characteristics of that relationship? When you think about the kinds of supports that you might need from me in our mentoring relationship, what comes to mind? People will tell you. Um, and it can help you to have a better sense of how to be of help where they are developmentally over time, and where to offer support and challenge. Um, I work a lot also with university faculty who are mentors to um, new faculty. And what always surprises me is time after time, people have offices right next to each other. Just carving out the space to engage in dialogue is a rare treasured gift. I had someone say a couple months ago that they work right next door to each other. But they never talk about this, like what mentoring is, how they can be of help to each other. Um, and just thinking about when, when thinking about either building mentoring programs, being engaged in mentoring programs, that um, people bring themselves to the relationship just as we do. So our own internal capacities, as you know from coaching, influence how we coach and what we can offer to other people. And other people's internal capacities influence what they need ex and expect from you as a mentor. So if you're a mentor or a coach to a group of people, it's likely that there's going to be developmental diversity in that group. And so paying attention to that and differentiating supports and challenges can be really, really helpful. OK. Um, so we are actually going to move into applications right now. And I've already explained um, what the two choices are. But I'm going to say one thing first. So what I'm going to invite you to do is, um, is to look around and see if there's anyone that you'd like to partner up with. And I also want to say that normally I get larger groups together to do this kind of activity. But because time is shorter in, in a, you know, 120 minute class. We're going to do partnering because that way each person will get more airtime. So, this is a minute to kind of look around and find a partner with the same color sheet as you have 
or want to use in case you took both. Thank you. Okay, seems like we're settled in. So we are going to do this in, in three parts. Um, the first part is if you're looking at the, either one of the sheets, um, you can just zoom right into the questions. The rest of it is context in case you want to use these exercises with people with whom you work um, or are trying to help around these same ideas. So, um, so you'll have 10 minutes to kind of think privately. That's step one. And then you'll each have 10 minutes to share and receive consultation on your plan or what you're thinking. If you're, if you're looking at the green sheets, you'll have 10 minutes to read, and then you'll have 20 minutes to engage in dialogue around how each of those three people are making meaning, what pillar of practice you would use and why, and what kinds of supports and challenges would you thread through the pillar of practice to meet people where they are and to challenge them. That's the green sheet. And if you're working with the yellow um, sheets, oh wait, you have green and you have green. So yellow's in the middle? Sort of. <laughs> OK. Anyway, um, if you're working with the yellow sheet, 10 minutes to design your practice, 10 minutes to kind of engage in dialogue for one person, and 10 minutes to engage in dialogue for the other person. I will be helping with the chimes. I'm also here if you have a question uh, while you're consulting or while you're reading, if I can be of help please just call me over. Does anyone have any questions right now about what we're doing or what you're doing? OK. I'll take that as a quick no. And if you do, please just wave me over. I'm coming. Green sheet.
We have about one more minute for this part. Popular? Okay, you might want to just finish up whatever you're working on in like the next 10 seconds. And um, then if, you're, if you looked at the vignettes and did, did those in relationship to the pillar practices, you have 20 minutes for this part. And otherwise, if you <coughs> did the yellow sheets, um, you have 10 minutes each. And I am here to assist you in any way I can. I'll help you with the time, at least. <laughs>
Mine is not up, but if you're working with the yellow exercise, you might want to make sure that you switch right now. We've got about, about nine minutes left for this part. Okay? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. National so Cathedral. Cathedral. So what is G8?
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's so much better to do it live. Like I've been watching some of the videos, mm -hmm. and it looks, it has such a different feel to it. Really? Yeah. And I thought it was great that, and I had Stone Lewinsky speaking from the stage, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, a universal design for learning and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Huh. That's so great. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, this is one of the bridges, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do, how do you think your online group is, is doing? They're doing great. That's so they good. They are doing great. It's been very challenging with them, but they've really had to have so much momentum. A couple of weeks ago, they weren't doing great, and I made them quote some readings in their classes, and uh, now they're doing much better. They have a better understanding of what's going on, and they're more scholarly, and the whole thing has more focus. They were just like BSing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like, this isn't worth it, that you guys have to spread. Uh, that is so cool. <coughs> Yeah, so that those are big revelations. Big ones, but they yeah. have really, so I've got a couple of superstars that pull the ropes along. So it's worked out it's really so cool. It I bet so you're cool. fabulous at yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know if I'm fabulous oh, I'm at sure it, you are. Was, I had a course yeah. in it, so it was, um, I've been able to structure it. So it's been great. Yep. Yeah. Just look at the time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, thanks for the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, if you'll just finish up your thought, like in the next 20 to 30 seconds, that'll be great. Okay, so this is a space for general questions, any ways that I can be of help, anything that you're thinking that you'd like to share out loud can be a question, an insight, a personal reflection. It can be in, in general or it can be about the exercise that um, we just engaged in. Yes. Uh, we, have nice we, have, we have mics now. <laughs> uh, we, we, we discovered or we developed this nice idea that we would find a coach for each of those people who would be one stage over them. Uh -huh. So let's say we have a person in stage four self-authoring. How, how would you find a number five or who could handle 
a stage four like this who is like you know competitive and challenging and likes to engage in different ideas where it would be great to have a stay uh, let's say a coach five but maybe you don't have a coach five mm -hmm. that's just one question i have mm -hmm. do, do you think you could have a coach who's um living life a little bit beyond self-authoring instead of having someone who's a full self-transforming knower uh yes mm -hmm. uh, we thought if if uh, we thought if the concept is there, that you can, that it, that there is not, you know, you don't have to be like either this or that, that it can be both and mm -hmm. if you have that idea, that would already be helpful. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think so too. Yes. <clears throat> We discussed. Uh, we made a good discussion to identify uh, the 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 complexity of each uh, three person, uh -huh. but uh, we had a difficulty to uh, how to challenge, uh, to design how to challenge them to in, uh, to make them increase their complexity. Uh -huh. So, which? Thank you for sharing that. What is your name? Uh, Rio. Rio. So um, Rio's question is around how to challenge people who, um, if, if you had the green sheet, there were three adults who are making meaning in different ways. So um, Rio's question is around how would I challenge Fran, May, and Day, uh, Fran, Mel, and Day. So does anybody want to help, help with this question um, before I offer my thoughts? So what kinds of challenges might be a support for Fran, who's more of a what kind of knower? Yes. Yes, In instrumental, right? Stage two-ish, um, order of consciousness. Um, and Mel, who is more of a what kind of knower? Three. Yes, so three, more socializing in his or her orientation. And Day is more so self-authoring. So it sounds like you had an easier time kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, offering supports, but it was more difficult to find ways in which you would challenge them. Um, so does anybody have any ideas um, which might be helpful to the whole group of us around, yes, thank you. So we have, we're passing the mic or the air stick. <laughs> so um, we took the clues from the narratives. Uh -huh. What um, people listed as feeling supportive, we thought, we should offer some of that uh -huh. as support. And what people listed as being unhelpful, we thought in some um, gentle supportive ways to incorporate into coaching to help them stretch. Uh -huh. And so can you name maybe one concrete way that you would offer a stretch to Fran, the instrumental per knower, Mel and Day? Sure, so for Fran, um, like she doesn't really see much point, or maybe it's a he, in um, sharing their thinking or even noting it down. It seems irrelevant to the uh -huh. process. So perhaps um, finding a way to demonstrate how like the thinking is actually, it can help them move forward mm -hmm. in improving mm -hmm. and how um, some of the knowledge does come from them as mm -hmm. opposed to from like the policies and other things mm -hmm. outside of them. That would be a big challenge. Mm -hmm. And then for Mel, um, we thought that, you know, this person would need to be affirmed a lot mm -hmm. about like how they're trying hard and doing well, regardless of what challenge we'll offer them. Um, and they would need to be pushed to express their opinion and to take a risk and express an opinion that differs from the person that they're seeking approval mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. And for they, um, we thought about kind of um, encouraging, encouraging them to, for example, if they're challenging someone else, like they think differently from someone else, instead of thinking in either or way, like either my way is right or their way is right, I would have to be convinced mm -hmm. of that, um, kind of thinking about both mm -hmm. and um, analyzing both 
in figuring out like maybe the best way to proceed mm -hmm. and yes. seeing like what each what is there of value in each approach mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes thank you and your name is Susanna Susanna thank you very much so those would be challenges you might also think about so those are kind of ways of engaging in collegial inquiry to push a little bit <clears throat> and also thinking about pillar practices just one example would be for Mel, a socializing knower, giving her a role as some kind of a leadership role, maybe as a team leader or being responsible for something would be a real developmental challenge and could offer her support, provided that she has someone to go and kind of think out loud with, or him. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Anyone else? Yes? I can grab the, oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, we also talked about for like a friend, uh, like a, I, one of the, first of all, start with a question first. I, I, she's a, like an instrumental, like knower, but mm -hmm. I also wonder like, is this in work context only uh -huh. or it's a global kind of order because the, the what she lacks is like, she just doesn't care. So mm -hmm. every rules and thing values is just external to her like she doesn't internalize, but suppose she's a mom at home, like does she act like that as well? So we were thinking is this like how to make her care more? So uh -huh. think of something that she really cares in whatever aspect in the school life and make her to be responsible for it and also have a co-leader that she will have to have a con engage in a dialogue to gradually cultivate her self-reflective mm -hmm. thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of my question is like, is this order, it just a performance particular to a con context or it's a global thing that she's to? Uh -huh. So <clears throat> usually, you know, we strive for consistency across context in our roles. Um, and of course, context does matter. So, but, um, and I think there are certain contexts where we can bring our biggest selves and all of our vulnerabilities and kind of be okay of pushing for growth. Um, I'm not sure if Fran um, is like that in the other domains of her life. I would imagine that Fran is. Um, and I also think that Fran does care about things. She just cares about them for different reasons. So it matters a lot to her. I love your idea of having a partner for Fran, an instrumental knower to talk with and about because that will force Fran to entertain more than her own or his own needs, desires, and wishes, just that dialogue. In general, though, um, you know, we strive for coherence regardless of context. So in our ways of knowing, we don't like kind of take them, put them on and take them off. So there is some kind, in best cases, consistency. Thanks for asking. Anyone else? Yes, Paul? We have time for this last question. <clears throat> this is, sorry, I guess we're really focused on Fran here, but the, my, we came up with the idea maybe for Fran to give her response, like a leadership role that was not in charge of people. Um, uh -huh. So, but, it, but that involved relating to other people. Uh -huh. So I think it's sort of simple, like we were talking about maybe the supply closet or something like that. Mm -hmm. not, not, I mean, it sounds yeah. funny, but I'm saying, so then, you have someone, people come to her and she has to understand like why someone might need something else. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of help have conversations around that. Yes. Would that be an appropriate support slash yes. challenge or mm -hmm. is that? Yes. Okay. And it also links to the idea um, that you just shared around being responsible for something. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank that was you. It was a very concrete question uh -huh. for a concrete <laughs> person. Uh-huh. Okay, so I, I am mindful of your time. It's about a minute after two. I want to let you know that I'm gonna hang around. If anybody has any questions or wants to talk, I will be here. And um, I also want to wish each of you well in the soul-filled work that you do. It has been an absolute honor and privilege to be in your company. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.